It's because you're on Twitch. I will censor my language for this. So y'all got to do the math, okay? And so I personally like to be torn apart. I like to be humiliated. I like- Like I've never heard of somebody being a virgin before going into BDSM. Do you think that that was like, is that something you would recommend? Because that feels very dangerous to me. I am, um, I'm really private. Like I know I share a lot about myself, but I'm like super private about my feelings. Well, there's an infantil, it's the infantilization piece that actually makes me uncomfortable, but I'm uncomfortable with lollies too. Like I, I still don't oh, know what I yeah. think about it. And one of the first scenes we watched was a woman do um, cock and ball torture. But I get why they get like gray, especially because neurodivergence is inherently a non-clinical word. Like clinical people don't use it. Oh my god, hold on, I just broke everything. Brittany, take a deep breath. Technology is our friend. Technology is our friend. Technology is our friend. <laughs> Yay, we're here. <laughs> we did boomer it. Boomer alert. Yes. I am literally known as like the boomer of all boomers on my channel, and honestly, I can't even blame anyone because I feel like one constantly. So, um, I titled my video that we're talking about kinks. Is that still accurate? Should I teach Yes, you yes. And okay. it's good that you want to be smothered today. I was like, perfect. I have I have a very specific kink that I wanted to ask you about that I think I've heard you say on stream. Just because I'm, I'm curious about it. I was like thinking about like lots of some kinks I'm like, I can understand. And then other kinks I'm like, I wonder what's like the psych, like the psych behind this of like what's appealing about it. Um, so the totally. kink I specifically, we can start with this one. And then I'm just curious broadly about, we can talk more about kinks. But yeah. you have a degradation kink, is that correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Because that is like the one kink that I think psychologically I have a hard time understanding specifically degradation. Um, like, could you yeah. walk me through like a, as much as you're comfortable, like what that looks like and then what what is arousing for you <laughs> about it? Oh, well, let's see how TMI we want to get today. I um, <laughs> Well, first and foremost, do you want to introduce yourself to my audience at all in case anyone doesn't know who you are? Oh, yeah, sure. My name is Not So Erudite. I'm on Twitch and YouTube typically, so you can find me. And TikTok. I'm going back on TikTok, so you can nice. find me there too. Yeah. I got to get on that. Um, and then for my background, just so people know, I've been practicing BDSM for over 10 years. I started at 21 years old. I was a virgin and I was mentored in, which is really lucky. A lot of people don't get mentors. It's really hard to find one because keep in mind, mentors are just people in the community that are willing to, for free, spend time with you and help you along your journey in kink. And so I was really lucky. Contrast one. super shattered um, $10 and really, really 73 respect. cents as a female um, streamer that watches you every day. I just so I wanted really to say thank you for being being an inspiration uh, to all woman. of us. My friends and she's I, ha ha ha, just kidding. Like we all 50s, know it's a sausage 60s, fest in here. Now. Um, but she's fantastic. And she's just taught me so much about, oh, she's got to be in her 60s now, actually, now that I think about it. It has been over 10 years. But she's fantastic and just absolutely a thrill to have in my life and on call. And she brought me in and taught me how to um, utilize the BDSM community, I think, in one of the best ways, which is like spiritually um, all encompassing. Uh, the idea is to utilize BDSM as not a means for orgasm, which is fine, but as a means of knowing the self better. And so for me, I learned it as a tool. So when I think about what humiliation like kinks I have, I think of what how it, how this tool serves me in my life. And so I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's a huge stereotype in our community that um, the people with the most like demanding jobs in real life, the people who have to be tops all the time in real life, love to go to the dungeon to let it all go. Okay. So mine is layered. The first layer is the desire to let go, to not be the one who's always in charge, to be the one who can trust someone enough to let them do something. And then the second part of it is truly the idea of facing all of those things about myself that I am insecure about. And so I personally like to be torn apart. Um, I like to be humiliated. I like, but with the safest people around, of course, heavily vetted and people I've known for a long time. I like to be, I like to have all my insecurities just pulled apart and made fun of. And it helps me face those things in a different way. So I don't use kink and BDSM as a means of orgasm, which is fine. I use it as like a meditation practice. So I don't like the purpose of my BDSM is not to orgasm and genitals are almost never used or interacted with unless you're like hurting them <laughs> in a particular way. Um, I could actually explain to you, I have this dream scene I want to do, but I haven't gathered enough people who want to do it with me because it's pretty damn traumatizing. And I think even the people participating in it would have a really hard time around it. Do you want to hear it? Okay. Yeah. I'm very curious it's, now. 
It's because uh, you're on Twitch. I will censor my language for this. So you all got to do the math, okay? So I have this thing where I want to do a scene where it's like five or six people, maybe even 10 would be amazing. And they all have like tomatoes or some sort of egg or something they can throw at me while I'm on a stand, kind of like a witch trial, where they confront me about my, my assault, my R word. <laughs> and where they sort of mock me and belittle me and tell me that I didn't do enough and tell me that you're so smart, like this is your fault. Like all of the things that you hear all the time. And I want to face the people who say those things like face to face. Because often when I hear those things, it's behind a screen name or it's a mystery or it's somebody who says it because they're angry. But I think I'd want to like, I just want to face a version of that in real life to kind of go through it, you know? And then every time I try to answer, I'm just like, something's thrown at me. So every time I try to talk, there's like an obstacle. Mm. And so there's all these things that I build up. I think BDSM allows this opportunity to create a scenario in which we know it's fake. We know I can save for it. We know I can escape. We know it's not real. But it is something that in the moment, I want it to be very, very real. Right? Like I want it to feel very real. And then that's why I love BDSM because afterwards I would need hella aftercare girl i would need to be like smothered because <laughs> that's a comforting feeling for me i would need to i would need to be held i would need to be told like hey you know that was like that's not how we feel about you that's not real that is we were representing that thing you needed to to confront but we are not that thing you were confronting and so it allows my tops and fellow play partners to also receive aftercare to say i know you're not that person i know you would never say this to an actual assault victim right okay so what what does aftercare typically look like uh, it's different for every person, first and foremost. Some people actually opt out of aftercare, which is aftercare, right? Some people like me, I need touchy, touchy, touchy. I need to be held. I need to cry. Um, I did a scene with my friends, a whole group of them. I have a thing around bananas. So I did this, this scene a while back where they all surprised me with different variations of banana torture. So well, someone came in a banana suit. Someone came with a banana muffin for me to eat. Someone came with a frozen banana to like strap on enter me with <laughs> um some people had all these very after i didn't cry like the whole time i was like this is not making me cry i thought i was gonna cry or something like i have this thing around bananas and then the top who was the focus of the scene came up to me he like knelt down grabbed my chin and looked at me and he said you are so completely worthless and i was like and then i cried and then the aftercare for that because it triggered the crying was being held and comforted so he like held me. We're not ro uh, romantic people together. We are friends. We're, you know, we've been, we've been friends for a long time, but he holds me and he just touches me and soothes me as a way to ground me back to reality. So it allows me to safely feel these horrible feelings without ever falling over the edge where I can't come back. And so aftercare regrounds. Okay. So it's like a regrounding. So it's kind of whatever people need. So when people are doing BDSM, it sounds like you're all pretty aware that it's decently psychologically distressing, but that's the point in large part. And it sounds for you somewhat like therapeutic in nature. Like you basically mm -hmm. get to face the things that like scare you and make you upset and like distress you and make you insecure, but in fundamentally a safe environment with people who you know don't actually feel this way about you, but they'll like act in such a way so you can confront it and then soothe you afterwards to be like, you're still safe, essentially. Is that kind of the idea? Totally. Okay. We always say, at least my friends and I, we tend to say BDSM can feel therapeutic, but it's not therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy. Most of us do have therapists. Because uh, those, you know, your mental health is can be separate from your kink, kink life. But a lot of us entering into kink to seek out control, I did. I actually almost joined the military. I went into a recruiter's office and I was like, I need to be told what to do. I need to have my control ripped from me. I need to have focus in my life. And I want to do this as a means to get control back. And he was like, okay, girl, you know, you cannot leave this contract for four years. I was like, so like, even if I don't want to be in this, I can't. He's like, not unless you have a really good reason. I was like, I'm out. Then a month later, I met my mentor. And she was like, hey, I have to tell you, I do this thing called BDSM. And I was like, oh, I'd read about it in books, but I didn't know it was like real, real. You know, like real, real. And it is. It's very real. And people are definitely doing it. Do you think it was, um, like, I've never heard of somebody being a virgin before going into BDSM. Do you think that that was, like, is that something you would recommend? Because that feels very dangerous to me. Um, a lot of people are virgins in BDSM. A lot. Really? Oh, yeah. Because keep in mind, there's a lot of second generation kids, too, whose parents are in BDSM. And then their kids go at 18. And they have, like, dungeon parties. And they hang out. Because I would say, like, 40% of the community doesn't even use BDSM for sex. Right. You know? I So I I would say that it's 
it's a beautifully safe place to be new and vulnerable because we have negotiations, we have references. Like, look, in what community do you sit down with a person you've just met and said, can I talk to your ex-partners? I need to get the references. And they go, of course, here you go. Okay. Like in the BDSM community, we give references out if asked, STI t- panels and testing done. We could, you know, negotiate safe words. Everything is negotiated if you're with another BDSM or who believes in negotiation the same, and a majority do. Okay, so our... What percentage of BDSM is, is sex and what percentage of it is more of like this kind of role play that you're describing? Because the role play you're describing isn't, it's, to what degree is your role play even sexual in nature? Because it sounds more meditative in Mine, nature. Mine, Brittany? Yes, you, Brittany. Um, none of my BDSM is sexual. So I don't add sex in my BDSM ever, period, the end. But I do add BDSM into my sex. Okay. So if the point of it is orgasm, then I want to add my kinks in turn me on and then I have sex with my partners if I'm in BDSM my kinks are not made to have me orgasm they're made to make me face myself and meditate okay mm-hmm. interesting do you think that because the virgin thing is still throwing me just because it sounds like really? your community yeah it sounds like your community is really safe but I also imagine like anytime you kind of get into these niche communities there's always people who like aren't safe and do take yes. advantage of other people. Totally. And so when I hear about like virgin, like, yeah, it, it can be great for like STIs and like consent building and stuff, assuming that they're in a really healthy community who's doing all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Cause BDSM, my understanding is like, depending on your geography, you're going to kind of have like different knit groups. Like, do, would you say when you do BDSM, it's kind of the same group of people or is it pretty, is it a pretty large populace where like you're seeing new faces all the time? Um, well, okay. So I haven't been inside of a dungeon in three years and most of them did have a hard time surviving COVID. Yeah, so most of them sense. are kind of shut down. Um, uh, but the conferences and things I'd gone to every year and the things we'd done, uh, it depends on what group you're in. Folsom definitely has more sexual components to it. I've noticed. And that's in San Francisco. Kinkfest in Portland is more educational and they do a lot of like non-sexual demonstrations. So it does depend on what communities you're interacting with. I was in Texas visiting some dungeons and I went to some munches and, um, some people were kind of shocked that I didn't add BDSM into my sex. And I was kind of shocked that they all did. So we were all meeting in different bubbles and interacting and going, oh, interesting. Like we do this different. So every community is going to have different rules and every community is going to have different generational expectations. Some of the older communities expect different things than the younger communities. Some people enjoy, like the older communities tend to have more structure to their BDSM and more rules. But the younger generation, I think, tends to lax on it a little bit. Or in some circles, like in Seattle, tend to be overly protective which is a little annoying. So there's like a balance that I think we're all seeking out. It's not a perfect community. I don't want anyone to think like BDSM is going to keep me 100% safe. No one's ever going to keep you 100% safe except yourself. Right. So we do have to be very careful on who we're relying on to do these things with, which is why I always play at public dungeons. I usually don't do pick up play, which is like meet the same night play. But even that sentence right there, pick up play, like that term is debated in our communities what it means. Okay. Interesting. So that you're referring to it as like basically somebody you meet on a site. Um, where do you guys typically, what would be like for people who are listening, where would be a common site to be even finding partners for stuff like this or like finding communities or finding dungeons? Right. So when I first entered the community, there was a website called FetLife. It still exists, but at the time back then it wasn't well known. It wasn't something you even told people about, but now everybody knows what it is. Oh my goodness. Everybody knows what it is now. And uh, FetLife is really popular, but the problem is FetLife doesn't vet its events. So if people host an event at their dungeon, it could be a house, it could be an apartment, it could be a hotel. So you have to see who's running the event and if they're safe. But you you have to, I hate to say this, underground communities mean underground rules. Right? Now, most dungeons you might come across are also going to be nonprofits and sex education centers. The big ones. Okay. Okay, so they're they're going to be hosted at like like a pride center potentially might also is that where they be hosted center, or do they usually more have like hotel um, locations? They mostly have their own warehouses or office spaces. So BDSM and pride and LGBT communities are obviously very overlapped. Absolutely, our histories intertwined. But we because pride is such a vanilla world, we also don't want to neglect the vanilla part of our communities that do need to have a non kink space. I'm sure you've seen it. One of the most heavily debated topics in all of our communities every year and it's going to come up june's coming up kids is going to be is kink should kink be a pride it's like the number one debate we have all the time and so it's always a very contentious issue because we all have different reasons for being at these events you know what i mean yeah yeah interesting interesting so um 
nowadays, if you're going to, so for you personally, are, do you typically have the same like 10 typical partners or how do you, how does that work? Yeah. Like for, cause you, yeah. you seem big on safety specifically. So I'm i I'm kind of a prude in the community. <laughs> so I'm kind of known as like a prude a little bit. Cause I don't do a lot of new partners. I have currently one partner that him and I are still um, in negotiations and play together. All the rest are still maybe options, but also very much like either out of kink right now or in kink or not interacting in the same way. So I don't even have like currently a lot of people. I just have one person I'm willing to play with right now. Okay. Um, yeah. And what, why, why is that? Like, why are you so cautious about that? Um, Okay, so like, obviously, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable with you. <laughs> I um, I'm really private. Like, I know I share a lot about myself, but I'm like, super private about my feelings. I don't want to watch. I don't want people and kink brings out BDSM brings out such a different part of me that is so vulnerable, that I prefer to keep that between me and my play partners. We don't record them. They're not on camera. At the dungeons, no one's allowed to have a phone in a dungeon. If you bring out a phone, you're in trouble. Or you have to have a piece of tape over your phone. Um, BDSM just gives me a space to be completely in my feelings. There's no one who's going to judge me. There's no one who's going to tell me I'm a shitty person for feeling feelings or expressing it a particular way. And so for me, I'm very particular because the scenes I like to do do go mentally darker. And so I don't want to traumatize somebody. And I want someone who's going to play with me in a very, like, who's skilled in their work. And that usually means they've been around a long time and they have a good reputation. So like my main play partner right now, he has a fantastic like reputation. He's wonderful. I've known him for many years. We're good friends outside of the dungeon. We met via the dungeon, but we're also friends outside the dungeon. Um, He's one of the closest people in my life. And I, I so appreciate him, but he makes me feel like I could bring any scenario up to him. And he'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's do that. Like he just, he's just so perfect in that way. Just non-judgy. Mm, okay. Um, so it, it, it really is for you. How did your, did, were you in BDSM when you were also going through DBT? Uh, yeah, but that was later. So, uh, I was in BDSM at 22 and then DBT came about 28. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if one had pre preceded the other. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. did you ever talk to your DBT therapist about like the BDSM, like emotional? Cause it's, it's a very emotional piece for you. Like that's, what's really interesting to me about yes. it. Yes. I emailed over 70 therapists and said, I'm BDSM and queer. You need to know what that is to help me. And, um, two people got back to me <laughs> and she was one of them. And she was recommended through my ther- through my insurance at the time, Kaiser at the time. And she was perfect. She didn't, she wasn't BDSM herself. But she understood it. She understood gay issues and it was totally fine. She never, I didn't want her to use my BDSM against me and say like, you're only in it because you're traumatized or your traumatized or your trauma came from BDSM. Like my mom, when she found out I was in kink, she was like, is that where you were assaulted? And I was like, no, funny enough. No, I was assaulted in a vanilla regular house party, just like a vanilla home. Um, sorry, people are just asking. DBT is yeah. dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a form of therapy commonly used for, originally it was designed just for BPD, um, borderline personality disorder, but now it's typically used for most kind of like treatment resistant and emotionally dysregulated folks, um, with borderline being still the most common population that it helps. Just because mm-hmm. people are asking what that is. Yeah, yeah, of course, which is awesome. I know a lot of my friends um, who were in BDSM and couldn't get their shit together did DBT, even though they don't have borderline, it really helped. Yeah, honestly, I, 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 anyone who's like a little bit emotionally dysregulated, I'm like, probably do just a little bit of DPT. It's just like mostly emotional regulation skills, which we could all use a little bit of. So I think it's pretty great. Okay. Interesting. So, um, would you and your therapist ever talk then about BDSM? Cause it sounds like you really want to be like these two things, like they're not ne- like they're, they obviously overlap, but you're trying to be like, please don't place extra level of like sinister Yes. to the BDSM like that sounds like that's what you were wanting yeah. your therapist to do so how would yeah. you guys talk about it in in DBT as like an emotional regulation strategy at all or we use it we well she saw it the way I did which was a tool she saw that it brought me safety and it made me feel really secure about myself she saw that I negotiated everything I talked to her about everything at that point like I was just ready to vomit all my information to get help I was like I was really dying like I was gonna kill myself guaranteed or unalive myself, I think is what I should say on Twitch. But like, I was, I was really ready. And so she, um, she didn't take it away from me. I know, I think she knew that if she did, it would have probably made me spiral more. 
Right. Because it was such a safe community for me. Like all my friends were there. All my friends were leftists and SJWs and queers. And it made me feel really safe with them. There was women's groups at the BDSM dungeons I would go to, like women's support groups held oh, really? by the dungeons. Yeah. So I spent a lot of my time there. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, because well, we're, you know, um, we're really open. Like kink communities are very open and they want to negotiate and they want to talk about being better with this tool and they want to make sure it's consent, consent, consent. And so like, there's just a lot of benefits to being in this community in that regard. Yeah, no, I agree. Actually, I find, um, I'm I'm actually at the point where I like, I kind of want to go to a kink type of community (gasps) just to like learn. Cause I'm, I'm not really a kinky person myself. I don't know. I'm like uber vanilla. Um, but I find it really interesting, especially from the consent piece. Um, because I've made a couple of videos on TikTok about consent specifically, and a bunch of people strongly recommended a couple of like pretty, um, popular kinksters on TikTok. Um, and I just Mm. went through their videos on consent and I was like, fuck, this is actually really Mm -hmm. like, obviously not all of it is going to apply for like vanilla settings. Um, but like the nuance that they have in just understanding what consent and stuff looks like is actually really valuable. Um, but people get like, nervous and weirded out because they're like oh it's a kinkster like uh oh like you and me melina should go to Folsom in san francisco which is like the easiest outdoor event to go to but it's not going to be they're going to have like when i was there last time they had like uh, consent matter stickers and i use those as pasties for the event <laughs> <laughs> and so like that was a lot of fun and so like stuff like that is really cute i like bdsm because it's you know it's risk aware kink and safe sane consensual is our saying safe sane consensual which always begs the question, well, how are you sane if you're struggling with mental illness? Because even those who struggle, we have like, I'm, I always say I'm healthy, but what does healthy mean on a spectrum? Well, I, I'm still working on stuff. Right. I'm still not unhealthy in the sense that I'm not spiraling every day. And even if I was, BDSM tools really helped ground me. So I utilize DBT skills within BDSM for the, for the time that I needed it. Now that I'm outside of BDSM and not in my communities as much, I mean, obviously I operate on my own right now it's real. I miss them so much. Like I miss the way leather smells. I miss the way like BDSMers act. I miss the way we talk and walk. I miss the way we do you, you know, we ask like, do you shake hands? Like, Oh, can I hug you? Like we ask every question, like, what are your pronouns? What is your name? Like, we're very big on like, what do you need from me? And can I provide it? And I just, it, it's so nice. Cause you don't have so, like social awkwardness moments. We have actually, we used to have at our local dungeon, there was like so many members, like 30,000 plus members at this dungeon. And, you know, every night, like a hundred people plus were at dungeon parties. And I was there like every day after work, just having the fucking best time of my life. We had like introverted parties, like parties for people who are introverted. We asked all our extroverted brothers and sisters to fuck off <laughs> for one night and let all the like introverted people have a night. Like we tried to create parties for like sensual parties, hardcore parties, parties that were for every kind of kinkster. So everyone had a place to go. And I just think that kind of consideration is lacking in vanilla culture. Oh yeah. I mean, vanilla culture is pretty black and white when it comes to sex. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of nuance, which is unfortunate. Um, interesting. Hmm. From that, I had written down a couple. So it's meditative, safe. It's really space, real kind of support group for you. I'm curious about mental health and how does, how do in BDSM, do you figure out like to what extent, cause trauma is going to be a piece that comes up because trauma inherently comes up in any sexual encounter. And I imagine in the BDSM community, you guys actively probably talk about it and like figure yeah. out how to negotiate it. So how do you guys <laughs> negotiate things? Like, for example, um, if you feel like somebody's maybe not using their safe word, but they maybe should, like, how do you guys negotiate these like tricky kind of mental health trauma related issues that might arise in a, in a, in a scene perhaps? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. It's very hard. No matter what community you're in, no matter how much you negotiate, there's always going to be people who fall through the cracks. You will have miscommunication. There will be problems. So what you have to do is within your own risk aware profile, risk profile, you have to make a decision on how you're going to interact. So I usually, for the sake of my partners, divulge all my sexual history, including all my STIs, all my mental illnesses, all my birth control updates, all of it, depending on what we're going to be doing. Even though I don't have sex during my BDSM, I still let them know my birth control status just in case it matters, just in case we're sloppy, just in case, just in case, just in case. Maybe there's one day Brittany's really horny during a scene and ends up fucking her partner. I don't know. Like, I just want to be super cautious, right? And knowing those things can help stop us from giving into our little urges. You know, they are a little, oh, wait, remember she said this? Remember he said this? Remember they said this? So I think you're first, except that you will, you have the chance of messing up. 
That is first. It's not perfect. It will never be perfect. And, and following that, it's going to be based off the individual. So like, again, for me, it's a lot of negotiation. I tend to meet like the top I have currently that I really love him. And I went out to like a local, um, like bar and we had our first negotiation meeting there. I drank a beer and I was getting too tipsy. So we had to cancel the negotiation. Okay. Interesting. And that is that and like a pretty ex- axiomatic rule that like if somebody's impaired in any way, negotiation ends or. So in BDSM, most dungeons will not allow alcohol or drugs. Uh, they serve mock drinks like mocktails for most of our high protocol parties. If there is alcohol, they have a usually wait three to four hours before playing rule. And that's usually enforced pretty heavily. Usually at a dungeon, if you fuck up even once, it's pretty fucking bad. What do you mean um, bad? Like you could get banned permanently. And oh, really? Yeah, because the risk that we're already facing as a community is so big in the legal world that we have to protect our people and we have to only have people who are responsible enough to not even put us in danger in the first place. Right, okay. So we try our best to be very, very cautious. But again, everyone's going to have their own version. I've met a lot of people at the dungeon who don't mind pick up play, who forget to negotiate for all these things, who maybe are also new. So when you go to a dungeon, they, uh, a dungeon that's established, they usually make you sign a huge waiver. It says, read all these rules, say I'm not impaired, say I understand, I'm 18 plus, here's my license, you have to give your ID. You have to really, you even might even have to become a member of certain dungeons first. Like a paid member? Before. Uh-huh, it's always paid, there are there is money involved. Um, and it helps to like keep people from coming in. One time, I'll tell you this, one time I was at a party at a dungeon, my friends were hosting, it was a physical building, like a, an office space that was made perfectly for a dungeon. And this guy came in through the door, totally drunk. I didn't know that though until he sat next to me and he was like, you, people say you educate in BDSM. I used to be a peer educator. He goes, tell me all the things. And I was like, okay, first of all, you're drunk. You shouldn't even be here. You're going to get kicked out. Second of all, I am not on the clock. I am also enjoying this party. I'm not going to explain to you BDSM. And then he was like, that's really fucked up. You're fucked up. And so I like waved my friend over and I was like, got a drunkie. He took him. He put, he kicked him out. There's no conversation now. He goes, well, I found you guys on Facebook and you guys said you were a sex group. I was like, you probably read the ad wrong. Do you see sex happening at this dungeon right now? And it was like one of those things where he like threatened us. And so we like had every person who left the dungeon party was escorted by somebody to their car. Oh, wow. Just as a safety precaution. Yeah. You know, and then if people didn't want an escort, that was fine. But most of the women or like femme presenting people or whatever were escorted with a person to their car, usually two people so we can have backup. Like we really want to keep our community safe, but you know, people come through the cracks Like people, things, bad things can happen. Right. You know? Yeah. So if, if you guys like, cause I feel like probably judging other people's kinks and everything is, is going to be not a very kosher thing mm-hmm. to do in the community. But for example, like what if you're concerned, like you see somebody engaging in practice and it seems like it really distresses them. And even in aftercare, they don't really get grounded well and they're really upset. And you're like, okay, this might be, mm-hmm. this might be unsafe. Like how would you guys navigate a situation where like, essentially you're kind of taking away somebody's autonomy and being like, I think you need to get help. And this is not the space to do it. Like, how do you guys navigate? Sure. Like, cause those are the trickiest, right? Where you're like, you're not doing something bad per se, but I think it's harming you. And like, we don't yeah. really want to participate in your like self harm essentially. Well, first we don't want to ick anyone's yum. Yeah. So I know that's going to happen. Cause even people have kinks where I'm like, mm, I'm out, but you know what? No judgment, gay judgment. I'm not judging you. I am just noted. Um, There are going to be kinks that you're going to see that are borderline unsafe. Actually, as an example, a very popular kink in also vanilla culture is choking. There is no safe way to do choking. Right. There's only uh, like uh, harm reduction, but it's not really safe. You can't safely choke someone truly because you're risking brain damage or death every time. Right. Okay. So one of the things I always say is be self-aware that any kink you have, any sexual activity you do, even handcuffs, if they're done wrong, can cut off blood circulation. And that can be an issue. But a lot of vanilla people, I've seen them at vanilla sex dungeons, they drunk will be in handcuffs and the girls or boys will be like slumping and you'll see like blood getting literally cut off. Right. And then when you go to them and you go say, hey, I think you should do this different. um, They usually just get mad at you. So my, I have a very much like not my business because it's it's usually not now we have dungeon monitors in place to be people to cancel out scenes okay so dungeon so you can go to a dungeon monitor and say hey i think there's some unsafe play going on do you want to check it out and they have the power to end a scene 
okay. and say, hey, I think you're doing something dangerous, but that's only if you have established dungeon monitors. And dungeon monitors can make a mistake. As an example, I was in a polycule for people, a female dom in the three bottoms. We were the bottoms. She was a top. And they were doing a scene, um, I with my partner and then her with hers. And again, we're all partners, but just for the sake of how I'm going to explain this. I finished my scene with him early. So we went over to her scene and she invited us into the scene. So BDSM scenes, we ask like you give space so no one gets hurt or enters the energy of the scene. And so she invited us in as ordered. And we sat where we could sit and be safe. And she flogged her bottom who had needles put into her back in a decorative way, saran wrap over for sanitary reasons. And then she was being flogged. Okay, it's a huge adrenaline rush, huge crash. We're sitting in the scene and him and I are just being all cute and we're sitting and we're waiting and we're like in our mid early 20s and we're just like waiting and a dungeon monitor comes over and stops our scene. And my top at the time, the dom, turns around and goes, why are you stopping my scene? And she, and the dungeon monitor was like, well, you have two people in your scene who aren't in the scene. She goes, no, they are my bottoms. They are my submissives. I own them. I have placed them as my property where I want them in my scene. And so they fought it out for a second and then the dungeon monitor realized embarrassed she had made a mistake. Right. Okay. So things like that can happen. It's no big deal. We talk about it after the scene, but it can kind of like get you out of the mood, which sucks. So you, you got to be really careful when you interrupt a scene. Are you sure you need to? And to prevent this from happening, what we usually would do is go to the dungeon monitors and say, we're going to do this scene. She's going to scream. She's going to cry. She's going to react this way. And I, as the bottom, would go and say, I am going to react this way. And I need you to listen for my safe word, which is usually we use the light system red green yellow yep. and green is like your no one ever says green but because you know it usually just starts the scene but yellow and red i use a lot yellow 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 change this yellow change that yellow harder yellow softer yellow i don't like that pain yellow i'm losing my circulation can you move my body yell you know red is like we're done or in Brittany's case hard red is what i actually mean so i usually will say red as a reflex because of my trauma i automatically am like i don't want to be here and I'm like, wait, stop. I don't mean that. My body spoke for me. I do want to be here. When you hear hard red, then you can stop my scene. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, and what does yellow mean specifically? Uh, it's just like a little, um, I don't want to stop the scene, but I need to change something that's happening. Okay. So it's like a course correction, essentially. Yeah, totally. Because we want in, like, in a lot of the, we want a, an ability to change things as they go on. Because, you know, sometimes you you negotiate a scene or you're winging a scene and you think it's going to be sexy. Like I thought putting a soap bar in my mouth would be sexy. It was not, girl. it was not sexy. It was awful. <laughs> it was awful. But I it didn't know that. Horrible. So I was, oh my gosh, the worst. Like yeah. just the worst experience of my life. And like legit, I didn't know that was going to happen. Right. Or if you do figging, which I've also done, not, not what I thought it was going to be. Not fun, but some people like it. You know what I mean? So what is figging like, for those listening? Figging is when you take a fresh ginger root and you carve it into a butt plug and then you insert it in. Ooh, spicy. Yeah, spicy is exactly the word, girl. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, yes. okay, I'm done. Brittany, can I handle this? Thank yeah. you for playing. So again, we do things. I'm a big adventure person where I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. Let's do it. As long as it doesn't land me in the hospital, let's do it. It's kind of my rule. Okay. Um, you said vanilla sex dungeon. So how do you guys differentiate? Because I think... Most mm -hmm. vanilla, like somebody brought up Levine, like vanilla people aren't really a community. And I'm like, that's right. Like, I'm not in this, like, we're not, I'm not like friends. They're like, we're all vanilla people yeah. having casual <laughs> sex. That's really vanilla, right? Um, <laughs> we don't have any theme songs. So what is a, yeah. what are you viewing as a vanilla sex community? Like, how is that differentiated from a BDSM community? So as an example, I usually have people send me dungeon ads. and like, is this a BDSM dungeon or a swingers dungeon? So swingers... I see as like vanilla people because they're not interacting with BDSM. So my definition of vanilla is anyone not BDSM. Okay. Usually, but that could be different depending on who you talk to. So when I see swingers dungeons, uh, sex dungeons, regular sex dungeons, they'll usually have 50 shades of gray BDSM stuff there, but they're not actually BDSMers. How do you like, separate those? Not, oh, it's very difficult, but it depends. So um, it's kind of like the same way. Um, how do I say this? It's really hard to say, right? Because you have people who wear leather who have handcuffs or just kinky who are not BDSM. So okay. the way you usually a line in the sand is usually if you read the BDSM books, go to the BDSM dungeons, talk to BDSM people, practice BDSM as like a meditative slash 
connective process with your partner in a way that feels much more like you're putting a label on it and therefore making it more important than it could be. So like I always say I want a partner who practices BDSM, meaning I want a partner who will go with me to the dungeon and not feel like they're out of place there. Okay. Like you're in the community versus if I was a swingers dungeon, I would feel out of place. Right. I, I'm not a swinger. I don't belong to those communities. And why is a swinger different than a sex orgy? Because they're, Burning Man has a sex dome. I don't know if you know this is like an orgy dome, Burning Man. They are not BDSMers. They are not swingers. They are sex orgy people. Now, they okay. could individually be members of a BDSM community and a swingers community. But at this time, this particular practice is just an orgy with people in the desert. Okay, interesting. Okay, so it's like when you're saying that somebody's a BDSMer versus a swinger, it's basically which community they dominantly identify with. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so so somebody can be a BDSMer and a swinger as well. Yes, yes. But the, and it doesn't, the dominance part's not too important, but it's more like, it's like, are you a D&D nerd or are you an anime nerd? It's like, it's okay, it might be a both nerds, but different. Right, okay, that makes sense. Um, because mm-hmm. essentially what, like, what makes it different is essentially the social scripts that apply, the rules that apply, uh, the expectations and prescriptions that apply ah, are fundamentally you- different give you a great example you know a swinger dungeon versus a bdsm dungeon based off how they charge the genders <laughs> bdsm Interesting. all genders are the same everyone's treated the same in swinger communities men are charged more women are charged less and men often can't come alone right okay because the whole point is sex and swapping whereas in bdsm right sex is often not even necessarily right. on the table or even allowed at certain parties okay right Oh, interesting. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is so the party you were describing for yourself with the, the guy who was drunk. That was a non-sexual BDSM party. Uh, that party, actually, you know what? Good question. It's just nobody at the time was even thinking about having sex. And I think it was a non-sexual party particularly. But we do have back rooms and bedrooms that we allow people to use to do sex at BDSM parties, even if sex isn't allowed at the main hall. Okay. It depends on how the dungeon is, is laid out. That's another thing too, right? Some dungeons, gosh, I was a part of this dungeon before it got shut down. That was like three warehouses and you'd go from one to the other and they had like adjoining hallways. And then they had a whole section walled off of just beds, 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 all with different curtains. And you grab the sheets and you grab the clink linens and you all have like covers. And it's just, it, it's just different depending on the space you're interacting with. Or there's house parties that I've also gone to that are so safe in the sense that they make all the newbies. He announces it. Everyone who's new, come down to the basement. We're having a 101 class. It's 10 minutes. You have to take it to stay. If I notice you're new and I don't know who you are, I'm kicking you out unless I see you in this class. And he does it. But there's weed a lot of those parties, alcohol out of those parties, because some people are just there to hang out with their friends and not play. Right. Okay. So it just depends. Okay. Um, yeah. Somebody's asking about language. Um, if you could... Hmm. You were saying terms are kind of different in different communities, like in the in the different BDSM communities specifically. Could you outline maybe which terms are maybe more global and which you think differentiate based on the community? Yeah, I think top, bottom, dom, sub are the most popular ones that, depending on the community you're in, could mean very different things. Okay. So vanilla people also use top and bottom, and they tend to use, so you'd be like daddy, and like daddy is different in BDSM too. Like, are you a daddy or are you a daddy? It's like different. Are you a daddy or are you a daddy are you like it's different mommy are you a mommy it's like very different so you can be a daddy dom who has little submissives they take care of you could be a person who's a top and therefore the daddy not a dom and not a daddy dom so like have you heard the word ddlg have you heard of daddy dom little girl it's daddy dom little girl it's the most controversial part of our communities i think it's really not that outrageous it's just grown adults dressing like young people from infants to teenagers or older. We have littles, middles, and then we have like older kids, but at that point you're just like being an adult. (laughs) But it's always adults, 18 plus, have to be able to consent. And usually it's just an expression based off of the individual. So I noticed for me, um, I used to have a DDLG kink and I kind of outgrew it. Yeah. The fact that you outgrew it actually makes me a little bit more nervous about it, to be honest. Um, Mm. like psychologically, I'm like, what does that mean? Um, you know, uh, why did you outgrow it? Um, Uh, I can understand why people think it's, it's weird, right? Like why it's uncomfortable for people, right? Because you're essentially dressing up like a child, um, which is just like a very dangerous area. It's just in our society, there is like, there is no grace. There is no nuance about that. There's just like, it's fucking weird. And I get it, right? Like, as people I'm, I'm friends, I have multiple clients who have been childhood sex victims and all these things. So I like, I get why it's like this weird area. 
Um, yeah. And hearing that you grew out of it makes me be like, oh, I don't know. Now I feel extra, extra nervous about it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but tell me more about it before I like, I, I don't want to yeah, judge yeah, yeah. preemptively. Well, first and foremost, it's always adults. So if you have any issues with adults dressing like kids, I think that's a problem on the individual and their perception of what it means to feel like a child. I think children are innocent and pure, and I think adults deserve a space to be that. I think adults deserve a space to let go of their res- adult responsibilities and allow someone else to take care of them. I think adults are, are have worked very hard in this world that's very difficult, and I think they deserve a space to say, I just want to be a kid again, and I want a safe space where no one's going to judge me for that. Because it is judged. You are judged. You always have to be an adult and perform and take care of and be an adult. It's exhausting. So some people, to remain childlike, play video games all day. Some people dress up in mini skirts and have binkies. I don't really see a difference personally because, again, it's just adults being very childlike. Like, I mean, my dad would say people who play video games are children because it's like you're an adult. Go do real adult things. Video games are not adult things, right? So I see a a version of a video game as a soother the same as I see as a, a binky for a person who likes a binky. It's a soothing thing we do to relax, zone out, spend time with our friends, whatever. Uh, a lot of the BDSM adults I know who do DDLG are also people who, not just me, just I know. So I'm not saying this is general, but just I know were people who were molested as children. And do struggle with the balance of being able to relive that childhood in a safe space without being judged. So in conjunction usually with their therapists who do tell them, usually when you heal from your childhood trauma, you might lose this kink. But not a lot of DDLGers even use sex in their DDLG. So we right. might call it a kink, but there might not even be orgasm involved in little space. So a lot of littles I know particularly didn't, I dated a girl who was my top and a little in my early twenties. And when we had sex, she was never in little space. When she was in little space, we never had sex. Okay. Because for her it wasn't sexual. It was just hanging out and being not responsible because she had a really stressful job and she was like the boss at her job. And then she'd come home to me and sometimes we'd switch. We're both switches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, that's very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, can I, uh, Chloe, I see your comment. It says video games are made specifically for children, though, like binkies. Binkies could be made for adults, though. There are people who make adult binkies. So I'm not really sure that I, like a mouth soother, like someone like me who likes oral soothing things. I usually eat, which my nutritionist says I can't do anymore. <laughs> So I have to self-soothe in a different way. And usually it's like rubbing my hands or having something close to me. So I understand that. But some video games like are made for kids, right? Like video games in the 80s and 90s were just for kids growing up for me. And then your parents did it with you as a way to bond with their children. Now we have adult games like MA ratings. But I don't even think that's what video games were made for, right? Wasn't, weren't they made for kids? We right. made them for adults now? Yeah, I mean, just... Kids- yeah. Just to be clear, I don't even see it as pedophilic, right? Because I think like pedophilic oh. is a very specific thing. It's being sexually attracted right. to pre-prepubescent bodies. And if you're a mm-hmm. 25-year-old woman dressed like a child, while there's an infantil, it's the infantilization piece that actually makes me uncomfortable. But I'm uncomfortable with lollies too. Like I, I still don't oh, know what I yeah. think about it. So like, just to be clear, I'm not accusing- Lollies, the fashion lollies or the sexualization lollies? I would say both. I actually feel a little bit weird about both. Like, for example, like when I'm looking at clothes that I like, like, like I like wearing thigh highs and stuff. Um, But I'm pretty picky about it because I don't want to wear a thigh high that also makes me look like I'm like LARPing as a four year old. Um, Because just like I, the same reason I don't like childhood pageants. Like I don't like dressing four year olds like 16 year olds. Like all of it just feels strange. I think actually the four year old to to 16 year old is the most uncomfortable for me. Um, but I think that's like the, the DGGL, um, DDGL. Am I saying that D-D- correctly? Wait, DDLG. <laughs> DDLG. Yeah, DDLG. DDLG. <laughs> all the, all the VGG and DGG acronyms are all yeah. blurring into one. Um, yeah. And also personally as a Brittany, I don't like people dressing up DDLG in public. I feel like, hey, like they're actual kids at this park, and now you guys look like twinsies, and that's super awkward. Y'all need to keep that to the dungeon. But then some people get mad at me when I say that. So again, we all have different expectations of behavior, public spaces. Like, um, uh, we try really hard as kingsters not to force our lifestyles on people because people didn't consent to this lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I've heard. I've heard. I saw a video of. I think it was pet play, but it was done at a public. Um, I think it was at a fair. Like it was a with rides oh, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there was a lot of kinksters, I remember, because I follow, a, I follow a, quite a few kinkster educa- educators yeah. on, on TikTok, and they were talking about, like, 
there's just a, I know there's just a lot of drama about it because they're like, it's public yes. and it not only is it public, but it's in, in a space where actual children are. And that isn't appropriate because a, the public isn't consenting to your kink play and B, the children particularly cannot consent and you shouldn't even put that on them. Right. Um, here's which the, is really here's interesting. The so here's the fight that happens in our communities and like, okay, so yes, most BD members agree with that. When it comes to pride, this is why pride is so contentious amongst us because it was also started by leather folk in BDSM who were gay. So to erase yeah. them from our history of pride is to erase pride's history. But as a person who wants to be a mom one day, I do want to take my kids to pride and not have them see men in beautiful chaps with their butts hanging out, which I love and I have in my closet. Okay. So one of the ways Seattle, as an example, at least last time I checked in the had gone to pride, they usually have the morning show for kids yeah. and the evening show for adults or the afternoon show for adults. So I just feel like there needs to be a space for both. Because yeah. not everyone wants their kids to be like, I'm not going to be a mom who lets my kid work. I'm sorry. Like my kid's not going to be sexualizing themselves under the age of puberty before they've even had a chance to just enjoy life. But some parents want their kids to be, some parents want to dress their kids up in like you said, pageants, which I also think are just gross. But Brian Callahan to super shattered want. $5. So, all of us Obama. Know, this chaos that happens like between our bubbles, I feel like is this, these differences. Everyone's the same. We're all gay. We're all queer. We're all pride. We're all LGBT. And yet we cannot agree on how and what to expose our children to. This is the chaos of the universe. And like, that's why I'm like, we all need to chill and be open to the idea that maybe we won't have a solution that works for everybody. So who's going to get the short end of the stick? Right, exactly. And so then I guess I'm curious what you think when it comes to who should get the short end of the stick. I always err. I, I think, I don't know if I always err, but I think our society errs on let's be as like conservative as possible. So like whatever's like the lowest common threshold of like what people are comfortable with. We'll right. set that as like, as the bar that way, most people are protected basically. And there's still going to be a couple people who like want it even more like careful yeah. and more hidden and stuff like that. But like, fuck them. We're going to set it at like the lowest bar. Do you agree with that? Or do you think it should be like somewhere? Cause I really like the idea, like how you were describing the BDSM warehouses where there was like introvert night. And then there was like, um, hardcore night and stuff like that. And it's just yeah. like, I don't know why pride doesn't, you know, just have separate like nights and events for the unique parts of their community rather than just like erasing an entire part. That doesn't really make sense to me. So that would be ideal, right? Like ideally we'd all just like create space for all of it to exist. Um, but then we run into the issue of like, I had at one point in the BDSM community, straight couples wanted to be identified as queer and LGBT because they are kinky. And I'm like, no. And so then we started fighting about that in our communities. Like, can, can BDSM couples be called queer? And I was like, no. And then we were all arguing about it. So you're never going to find the answer. So I think the answer has to be pretty basic. If you're BDSM, you can be at, at Pride if you are not at Family Day. So I think there should be a Family Day. And I think you can be, even BDSM, though, can be child appropriate if done correctly. But you have to be, here's the thing. Here's my, tr okay, here's the truth. I'm watching the show on Netflix. I know it's going to sound like a tangent. Please like stare with me. I'm watching <laughs> the show on Netflix and she used to be an Orthodox Jew. And then she became like the number one woman who owns the number one modeling agency in the world. And she is like coming from trauma, coming from oppression. So she's letting her kid who's like a teenager, like make out with these boys and girls at parties in front of bosses and be really sexual. And I'm like, ma'am, you are setting your daughter up for failure by looking unprofessional, by being a hoe in front of her bosses, instead of explaining to her that yes, we want sexual liberation, when appropriate. And when her sister tried to talk to her about it, it was like, well, why shouldn't she be sexual? Why shouldn't she be out there? Why shouldn't she be? I understand because we are all so traumatized by our conservative backgrounds. We want people to be free. But do we not want to consider that we might be moving out of trauma and we might be stating our fear of being controlled out of trauma? Right. And so we, we have to create a balance with, okay, yes, sexual liberation, but when? Right. Context. Yeah. I you know? think that in trauma piece is so interesting to me about this community because I think, I think the trauma element is why originally I think a lot of people were like, Oh, it's bad. Right. Because it's just, it's mm. coming out of trauma. But I'm like, well, like if it's, if it's engaged in a really healthy, positive way and it fundamentally like helps the person or they just enjoy it, it's not inherently bad. Right. It's probably, yeah. it's probably somewhere between like, there's probably bad cases of it where somebody is fully acting out their trauma and they're not engaging in enough aftercare because they're like somewhat dissociated and they don't know how to and stuff like that. And then you've got right. this weird thing where people are somewhat like accidentally to maybe not so accidentally enabling people <clears throat> to essentially engage in some level of like self-harm, um, which you know, I don't know how you guys I'm, feel about self-harm. So I'm curious. I'm just, well, first of all, BDSM is not self-harm. No, I agree, but I think people could try to use it for it. Yes, but usually 
The only, okay, so there's so many here. First of all, name a community that does not encourage toxicity or trauma bonding. Oh, I, I'm not blaming the BDSM. I'm, this this isn't you, a critique of the BDSM. I want the people listening. Yeah. I want people to understand you are not going to find a community from your churches to your schools to your therapist offices to your BDSM dungeons to your queer communities where there will not be corruption, molestation, overuse of power, parasocial relationship, all the things you can name. Name all the bad stuff. It exists, right? Right. So I think first we have to stop rejecting people from living their best existence because we are uncomfortable. Because we have to be open to the idea that somebody might have discovered something about life we haven't. And so I think BDSMers have discovered something about life that other communities haven't, which is that you can negotiate and still feel sexy. You can have boundaries and still feel safe. You can have safe words and it's not going to ruin or stop us from having sex tomorrow or BDSM the next day. That you making your boundaries clear is not going to be a punishment for you. If anything, you're going to get rewarded as a safe player because now we know you how to, you how to put down boundaries. You get rewarded in BDSM communities for being good with boundaries. Mm-hmm. You get a reputation of being a very safe person to play with versus in other communities, they want you to be loose. They want you to drink. They want you to get drunk. They want you to put yourself in situations that are dangerous because they don't want to deal with any of the consequences up front. They just want to be like, that's for me tomorrow, you know, and then they blame you while you put yourself in that position. You know what I mean? There's a lot of like ickiness there. Um, You said something. Sorry. Um, What did you say? I was talking, I, I find that the trauma interrelation with BDSM very interesting. Like how you, you had mentioned that sometimes oh, things will go away. And I was like, oh, self-harm. I was asking like, how do you guys yeah, navigate yeah. that? Because I can imagine, like I said, I think this will be probably ideally fringe cases, but like, this is a thing I'm trying to be like, how do you like notice that if you think that it might be happening? Because there's a big thing of like, you don't want to ick people's yum. So how do you know if it's self-harm when it's like, it, it's BDSM? So like, yeah. Like the physical, so, sometimes physical pain and, and emotional distress is part of it. So how do you guys navigate that? Well, it, the problem is, is like, it's not us navigating it. It's individual dungeons, individual play partners, individual people. So some of us, um, what we try to do is we try to negotiate with our partners and ask about their traumas and say, why do you like this kink? So usually they have a BDSM checklist. Again, I was trained this way, but newer generations are a little lazy. So they don't want to print out paperwork. But like I was printed out, my first negotiation with my mentor um, was here's a BDSM checklist. What do you think about anal? Why do you like it? Why not? Why are you doing it? It was like they wanted to know why you wanted to do it. So if you said something like, oh, I want to do like I have scarification in, on my thighs from two different scenes I've done. And that means they've taken a sterilized cutting device and carved an image into my thighs, you know, and those are two different scenes by two different people. And when I did these things, it was very much like, are you a cutter? Do you self-harm in this way? Is this going to trigger any self-harm issues? And then Mm. we talked about it. I've never been a cutter, a self-harm. I'm going to be real. I'm a pussy. And cutting yourself is very difficult. And so I cannot do that. My self-harming is very different. It's usually like starvation or neglect or lack of sleep or um, it's just, it looks different. So as an example, with my former Dom, um, when I would self-harm and he would notice I wasn't sleeping, he'd say, okay, bedtime. And I'm like, why? And he's like, because I can see what you're doing. You're neglecting your nutrition and you're neglecting your sleep. This is an order. This is a BDSM thing. Go to bed. And I was like, fuck, now I have to listen because I'm collared and he's my dom. Right. And so it was kind of one of those things where if you have a good partner who wants your best interest, they're going to consider your feelings. But if you have a partner who's not so great, they might encourage that self-harm. Yeah, exactly. Um, Just like any situation. Okay. So you guys kind of negotiate. How do you guys then, uh, how would you, so maybe I should say you guys, how would you navigate, for example, like if you were maybe advising like people new in the space where like maybe somebody had a history of like certain self harms or maybe even like addiction and stuff like that, some sort of like complex Mm -hmm. mental health history where there's a couple of kinks that they're asking for that you're like, you know, it, it is tied back to, for example, a very specific trauma, or maybe they do actively engage in cutting, but they also want kind of scarification kinks and stuff like that. Mm. How would you guys navigate that as safe as possible? Or you, how would you navigate brain, that or advise so, them? Yeah. So my brain, if I was giving this advice to someone would be, I want to know why I'd want to know what therapist you have. I'd want to know where are you in relation to your recovery? I'd want to know if you even were open to getting a BDSM therapist so they could come talk to us, like as a play partner. Um, and a lot of our community members are therapists, so they usually don't combine those things, obviously. Yeah. But they will um, oversee a scene as a protective measure. Okay. They're, um, they're mind, like psychologists, sorry? Like when you're saying therapists. Is psychologists, that therapists, like there's people with medical degrees, there's doctors. My former play partner was a surgeon. Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, everyone with their skill set, like when I did needles, I went to a class run by a doctor. 
teach us how to do needles safely. So like that helps. But remember, BDSM is volunteer. Rarely do you have a job in BDSM world. And yeah. if you do, that's great. But keep in mind, everything is volunteer. So when we go to the dungeons, no one's giving anyone money to play with them. Everyone's like, hey, I like you. Do you want to do a scene together? Hey, I like you. Do you want to? So we are we are real people with real feelings trying to bond with people. So real trauma needs to be handled by people who can understand it. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes people just go, I'll love you enough and maybe it won't hurt you. That's not how it works. So it's really going to be up to you as an individual. So I would say get a professional. Be res- responsible. If you're dealing with addiction and it's constant and you're in and out of rehab, I actually wouldn't recommend BDSM at all. Okay. Why is that? Um, I think if you're substance abuse if you run the risk of coming to play with your partner intoxicated it, it, there's a lot of medical consequences as an example if you're on alcohol your blood is going to be way thinner you do a cutting scene and all of a sudden you're bleeding too fast and i can't help you right 911 is not going to get here fast enough right um you might be impaired you might be lying your partner might not know how to tell if you're impaired and then all the and then that includes weed you cannot get high and do bdsm traditionally at most dungeons it would be very very taboo right because of the you know, like blurriness around even consent, because it's like, how are exactly. you, are you giving informed consent if you're not fully cognitive? Totally. Now people might feel that way also about mental illness, which is why we say safe, sane, consensual. So right. the sane part doesn't mean you have to be cured. I'll never be cured of most of my problems. Right. But you can be healthier. You can be better. You can be safer. And so it's up to the people and their discretion, whether or not they want to play with someone with borderline um, but in BDSM, since a lot of us do deal with issues and because we have the negotiation tools at hand, we often feel safe to say, I'm so sorry, I'm triggered right now, I can't play. Versus, I think in other communities, if you say, hey, I'm triggered, I can't play, someone might be like, ugh, again, you're sick again. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what would be, so like, think of me, Normie, I come from very fundamental Christian background. I'm not, I'm not part of that like world anymore necessarily. Um, Mm -hmm. right. But like all of the wonderful sexual shame that you get growing up in that world. Um, what do you think it would be like, like the first time somebody like me walks into a dungeon, like completely doesn't know anything, obviously sign all the waivers. If there's an education, so do all the proper steps and we're there to be respectful. Like we're not there to be a piece of shit or anything. We're just like, what the fuck is this world? What would you expect my experience to look like? Like what would, what could I expect walking into a dungeon? It's going to depend on the parties, but you can expect leather. You can expect whips and floggers. You can expect people to be really friendly. You can expect people to be really warm. You can expect people to greet you and say, hi, how are you? Are you new? What would you like to know? What can I do for you? Um, You'll have a really good direction, so you won't ever feel too awkward at a dungeon. They'll usually give you clear signs of where to sit, what to experience. Um, I took, I was mentoring a girl and I took her to her first BDSM dungeon party. We walked into this beautiful, beautiful dungeon in Los Angeles. And one of the first scenes we watched was a woman do, um, cock and ball torture. And she used clothing pins on his testicles and genital area. And that was her first time seeing that. And she was like, this is crazy. I was like, are you okay? Do we need to move away from this scene? Do we want to be away from it? Um, Usually in dungeons, they have specified areas to do like medical play. So if there is going to be blood, they usually warn people in case anyone has an issue around that. Um, There's usually ways to close doors or put like cloths over places so people don't feel like they're a part of that scene if they don't want to be. So it just depends on the party. Like if you go to a sensual party, you probably won't see blood. Right. If you go to a like a cuddle party, you probably won't even see naked bodies or you might if there is nude cuddling. Right. So it just depends on the party you're going to. But I, I would just be open to seeing a lot of uniqueness and a lot of joy. So often what I find is so funny about torture is that it makes people laugh. People are laughing. I remember I got tortured in an electric uh, chair machine. It was like an electric chair a guy had built. And I got to the highest level of pain thresholds, beating out a bunch of people, including my own partners. And I felt really proud of myself because I'm a heavy masochist. And also I was laughing and giggling. I was like, more, more. And I was laughing and he was like, oh my God. He's like, why did I even try this on Brittany? And it was like a big joke and it was very fun. But laughter is one of the most common things at a dungeon. Okay. Interesting. Um... So are you, when you walk through a dungeon, are you able to just like observe people's scenes or like, I know it's going to be different, but broadly, are you able to like, obviously you said give space, but can you like stand back and just kind of like watch and sip your your mocktail and and watch? 
trust me when I say this, most BDSMers, uh, the ex the ex exhibitionist ones, they're please watch, right. please watch, you know? I'm not actually an exhibitionist, meaning I don't get turned on by being watched, but my partners usually did, so we would do public dungeon scenes. Plus, it's a safe place for me to yell and scream, and no one's gonna call the cops, right? And I love to scream, I love to feel my feelings. So um, yes, there are seating areas, there are social areas as well. Hey, we don't wanna do kink right now, but we wanna talk. So there are places to sit and hang out with people. Be like, so uh, what do you do on Tuesday nights other than BDSM? Like, what do you do in your real life? And then at the dungeon, because privacy is so important, you just give a name. Doesn't have to be your real name. Doesn't matter as long as the legal people who gave your ID, you give your ID to. They have your legal information. In the dungeon, I have play partners, but I don't know their names. I don't their real names. I don't know their ages. I don't know what, what they really do outside of the dungeon, though I know a little bit. But I've known them for like eight years. Right. So like I just. I just, when we're in the dungeon, that's when we hang out and that's all I need to know. Right. Do you know that you don't know their names? Yeah. Okay. Unless their parents were really weird, named them animals. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, that's fair. I was going to be like, <laughs> oh, like yeah. if they're like, I'm yeah. Stephanie. And you're like, I know you're Angelica. No, no, like, no. Nice try, <laughs> Stephanie. People ask me that. People ask me if Brittany is my BDSM name because I don't choose a different name. I just go by Brittany. Yeah. And they're, I was like, no, Brittany's my real name. They're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I don't have a BDSM name, Brittany. Like, you think I would have chosen Brittany as my BDSM name? <laughs> what would you have chosen if you did, if you could pick a name? What would you have chosen? Um, Brett, Master Brett, Brett something, probably something like, not really, Master. you can't choose Master. Don't choose, don't choose Brittany Master as like a regular term. In BDSM communities, they could be really offensive. I oh, really? Just, like, yeah, yeah, because Master is usually a title that's earned, depending on how you experience kink. So, like, I actually wouldn't use that name. So, um, but, like, something like... um. I don't know, something with brat in it, something like, you know, Bert the Brat or something, like, because Bert's my childhood nickname, so maybe something like that, something okay. that mixed with my kink or something, because I'm primarily a brat, so out of all my kinks, masochism and bratness is my top two. Okay, so what does, uh, walk me through a brat, like, what does that look like? Sure, so a lot of contention in the community around brats, because I think a lot okay. of people don't understand what a brat is, and I think even brats don't understand what brats are, but brats are people who basically try to top from the bottom with the hope of losing. Okay. So okay. usually so they're very like come... wrestly, at least psychologically wrestly. Yes. And then hopefully if you're lucky enough physically, but it's a lot of like, if a, a top came up to me in the dungeon and probably said something like, uh, are you a little, I'd be like a little bored of you. And then he'd be like, oh, you're a brat. And I'm like, only for people worthy. And then it'd be like a back and forth of like jabbing each other to see how we mesh with our energies. And then we can negotiate for like, oh, I like your brat energy. I like your status energy. Let's hang out. Okay. So it depends on, but it depends on the interaction, the style of party you're at. If I'm at a high protocol party, my brat is completely subdued and I am in service submissive mode. Like I would never bring my brat to a high protocol party, but I would bring my brat to a regular dungeon. What's a high protocol party? A high protocol party uh, happens where it's usually orchestrated in a house party or in a dungeon where everyone is dressed to the nines, very much like Academy Awards, like dressed very pretty, just very beautiful. There's usually servers and diners. So you have people who volunteer to be servers. They come out with towels. They come out with towels that also represent what kinks they have. So if it's yellow, it's like uh, water sports. If it's like different colors, it means different things. So they'll walk out, they'll serve you your mocktails or your hors d'oeuvres or whatever they're doing for the night. Usually we have potluck parties, depending on the vibe. And then everything's very beautiful and it's very like, hello, master, da 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 da. Here is your mocktail. Oh, thank you. Good job. And you get a little reward and you get patted away. And so it's very much like you're high role playing. It's like role playing to the nth degree. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Boot, we do like boot. Like, have you ever seen someone like um, boot black? Like, take the boots and like reshine them and recolor them and make them beautiful again? A lot of that happens. I usually go to cigar and whiskey high protocol parties. So we'll do whiskey in the beginning, play four or five hours later into the evening. Okay. And then that's really fun too. So we'll have like really fancy whiskey people. We'll even hire people in the community or ask them to volunteer who actually are professionals in their vanilla world with these jobs. And then they'll show up to the events and actually host, which is so fun. It's, uh, if you can go to a high protocol party with the right people, it is the best time. Is, would you say that's like some of your favorite stuff? And then why would oh. Brat not be appropriate in that space? Um, it is some of my favorite things because it allows me to challenge myself in my discipline for not bratting. Bratting would be rude. So it would just be bad manners. You know, you're at a high protocol party, you hand someone a fork, you say, would you like anything else, sir or madam, or if they have a different pronoun or way of being spoken to. And then, you know, you do what you do. And then if I just, if they went, could you take this trash for me? And I went, maybe if you blah, 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 blah. And be like, okay, you're ruining the mood, bro. 
Like I'm supposed to say, of course I'll take the trash. My pleasure. It's my it's my pleasure to serve you. It's giving them. It's a symbiotic thing. I want to feel like I'm serving. They want to feel served. If I was a brat, that would like be so exhausting. Right, where you're like, why did I hire you? Get the fuck out of here. Like, yeah, you'd be like, fired. why are you even here? Yeah, exactly. I'd have to sit in a corner, not the fun way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'd be you'd be timed out in a in a not a fun way. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Do you ever want to go? Is there any part of you that's like I kind of want to see that? In a oh, for way? sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> we should go. Yeah, I, once, okay. I just, I just like experiencing stuff. I want to go. Oh, yeah. we should go. We should go to Fall Sun. We should go to King Fest. We should go to all the public events. Like King Fest would be the greatest, I think, because it is um, anything that does conferences that actually have real classes. I think are the greatest way to get involved in kink, and then at night it turns into a big play party. Right. Yeah. So you learn, take a rest, come back, and use that knowledge in a good way with your community. Yeah, I like getting kind of inside understandings of communities in general. Like, even if I'm not interested in like necessarily participating, uh, it's the same reason why like um, the Pride Center and stuff. Uh, it's still closed for COVID, but they often will run like monthly meetings and stuff like that. And I'm interested in going, not because I'm LGBTQ, but I'm just like mm-hmm. kind of curious about that world and want to hear. Yes. Like, I'm very much like I'd I'd rather hear it from the horse's mouth because um, I can read I'm your about it. Girl. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes, do it. No, I love it. I brought my vanilla friends to the dungeon. I've definitely been like a bridge. I like to bring people to places. I like them to know like, this is my life. This is the stuff I do. So you don't have to fill in any weird fantasy misinformation of my life. I'll just show you my life. So you can see that it's real. You know what I mean? It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. It's some of my favorite communities are queer BDSM communities. Yeah. Yeah. They can be super, super nice. Um, yeah really especially if you're like seeking acceptance um yes yes and even look i know in fighting happens in all our communities so don't pretend like that drama ain't gonna happen girls is gonna happen but it's just differently negotiated i feel so comfortable negotiating with people now that i even negotiate with my siblings and my family hey guys i have boundaries i've taught my siblings also like spoon theory and bdsm safe words i'm like ah red i'm done i'm gonna get triggered red hard red i'm out and like i've taught my siblings this and it I think it helps with communication. Right. You no. Know? Like explaining boundaries and how to do it well. Um, it's really interesting. It's an interesting community because everyone will be very practiced at uh, voicing boundaries and then probably to some extent being rejected. Because I imagine not everyone yes. that you approach to do a play is going to say yes. And in yes. a BDSM community, I imagine you need to take your L really well or you might be very quickly exited from I just did a collaboration on this um, with Evie Lupine a while back, like a year, two years ago. I don't remember. We talked about this, how I think rejection is consent. Consent is rejection. Like being rejected is somebody saying, no, thank you. And for you to be insecure about that is you being insecure about consent at the bottom of this. Like at the, the very depth of this, it's like we need to make it a safe space for people to say no. So in BDSM, when I was brought in, this might have changed recently, but I hope not. No is a complete sentence. So my, my dom taught me, like, you say no. Then if people go, well, why not? Be like, oh, I already said my complete sentence. No. Because you shouldn't have to explain why you don't want to do something. Right. BDSM is the only space that's given me the permission to have no as a complete sentence. Interesting. What do you mean by if somebody's insecure about a rejection is because they're insecure about consent? What do you mean by that? I think a better way of looking at consent is not they're rejecting you. They are saying their boundaries that have nothing most likely to do with you. Rarely do people like, look, okay, I was just saying this the other day. I have so many amazing like women and men in my life that I'm like, I fucking love their brains. I love their bodies. I love the way they look. Why am I not into them? Why do I not find myself attracted to them? Why do I not want to marry them? But I want to marry them. And I realize it's because whatever that thing is that we're all looking for in another person, it's not in every person we meet, no matter how fabulous you are. Right. Sometimes rejection is just the person who's rejecting you saying, you know what, for me, you don't seem to be that energy I like more so than saying you are the problem. Right. You know, so I think if we looked at it that way, it could be better. Now, obviously, I'm not making a period at the end of my sentence like every situation is. Right. But I think insecurity often comes from misunderstanding. Interesting. Um, Okay. This leads me, I really wanted, because we wanted to talk about neurodivergence. I'm going to use the washroom. Yeah. This is a great, like, break point Perfect. for me to use the washroom. Grab snacks if you want. Okay. I'll be right back. What do you want to do, my mouse? Do you want to sit with me or not? Is that your, is that a, oh, kitty. That's yeah. a kitty, right? In, yeah, Indiana Jones. She's amazing. Hi, my mouse. 
Make a decision. Do you want to sit down? I came back and she was sitting in my chair and I was like, this bitch. <laughs> well, my dog joined me because I have food now. So she's all FYI, in. My, the internet is telling me my stalker's in your chat. Just FYI, she's resurfacing now. I don't talk to her. If I legally never say her name, she can't take me back to court. So FYI, sorry, that's happening. She's, she's just mentally unwell. Oh. Oh. It's intense. Taking you back to court? Yeah, she tries, like, she tried for defamation or some bullshit or a restraining order. It's confusing. Either way, it doesn't matter if I never talk about her again. By name, because no one knows. Look, I describe my stalker and you feel like that's you, that's on you. <laughs> that's fair. Okay? But I don't say no names. That's fair. Wow. That is, uh, unf- how long have you had this, um... How long have you been dealing with stalking issues in your life? Good question. Um, it's been so long now. And you know how it happened? It happened because I did meet viewers offline all the time. And she came. She was going through stuff and wanted help. And I talked to her. And I went home. And I was like, I don't trust this girl. She seems way off. And um, people, she found her way into the community anyways, the BDSM community. Eventually, she got also rejected from a lot of people, too, in the community because she was falsely accusing many members of our community. Um, so it became apparent. But since, like, I don't know, like, I don't even know anymore, girl. Like, honestly, 2016, 2014, 2015, 2016. I don't even remember. Too long. <laughs> I'm tired. And honestly, that's why I don't tell anyone what state I live in anymore. I don't tell anyone where I live because I don't want to deal with her or anyone like her ever again. Fair. That is. Mm. It is the most exhausting thing in the world to like deal with somebody and like, I wish her the best. I hope she gets the help she needs. Leave me out of your recovery. <laughs> that's fair. So um, exhausting. I, sorry, did you say she's in my chat? Apparently. Someone's saying, he was also in Destiny's chat, but I warned him. So he should be safe. But um, when she gets, she's affected over 12 people. She's impacted so many families, so just like FYI. And um, we all have our ability to avoid her, but anyone who's new, like, she, they're just gonna, that's the problem, is like, you can't legally do anything about her. Yeah. You can't put her in jail, because like, what would that serve? I don't even believe in prisons. Like, she can't go to a mental health hospital, because like, no one's gonna help her. She won't consent to help. So like, she's just gonna be a lost soul around the world who like, finds the next scam victim, I guess. Well, I can send you information if you need to, but uh-uh. yeah, like, I don't want anyone hurt by her, but I can't. Pro- that's a pro- that this is my biggest struggle. How do I protect people from people that just exist? Right. Like, I have no idea. It's such a struggle. Ugh, exhausting. Perfect segue into neurodivergent, neurodivergent people. I was going to say, let's talk about neurodivergence branching off of that. Um, yeah. Because you were really interested in talking about that specifically. Yes. Oh, my gosh. You know what? It really hit me this last couple of weeks dealing with, like, new audience people that weren't my people. And why my audience – I was trying to figure out why does my audience understand me so well? Why can they take my work <clears throat> and repeat it to other people so with such accuracy that I'm like, damn, you should have written this. Like, you should have been the author of this. Like, they're really good at understanding me in the way that I talk. Even when they don't, which we see in voice chat a lot in Discord, is we talk it through so long, we go, oh, Brittany uses words this way, and you use words this way. And so when when the conversation started to come up, I started to ask my audience, like, how many of us are neurodivergent? It's a lot. <laughs> it's not a, everybody, but it's a lot. And then I was like, okay, so maybe it's a neurodivergency thing where people are hearing the way I talk and the movements I make with my face and my need to always like self-soothe. I've noticed some communities make fun of me. They're like, oh, she's anxious. <gasps> Look at the way she's self-soothing. And I'm like, yeah, like I self-soothe all the fucking time. Right. And so it's, for me, I'm used to it. Like um, somebody the other day said, I just wish I could go to a community and say, I'm borderline and have everyone not kill me for it, but also know what it means. I was like, you can, it's called borderline communities or even BDSM communities are self-aware of mental illness or there are communities you can go to and say, I have borderline and people will be like, oh, I know what that means without judging you. And I know what it means enough to consider your feelings. Yeah. And so what I'm wondering is, why do you think it is that people on the internet say they want inclusion, want inter- neurodivergent people around, but when the neurodivergent person shows up and is themselves, they're like, they're weird. Why aren't they normal? Why can't they be normal? They're annoying a lot of the time is another one, right? Um, it's because uh-huh. a lot of people, it's the same thing I run into with like homelessness and addiction is like everyone is so accepting of these things from afar. 
Um, Mm -hmm. But it's very different dealing with it in person. And most people are like, of course I can like be really sympathetic to somebody with like autism, but then you have to deal with them on a social level and they're going to like not read you well. They're going to like say some off the cuff things that might like rub you a little bit wrong. Um, they might get kind of upset at something you've said that you like didn't mean in any sort of way. Right. And then all of a sudden like, holy shit, this person is like so annoying. Um, it's because like, I basically say like people love the idea of mental health and they don't like the symptoms. Um, they don't want to actually deal with the symptoms. Um, and so I don't know like why that is. I just think it's like It is hard to have grace, I think, for things that you've never been exposed to. Um, It's hard to know, like, when you're listening to something to, like, be like, okay, I get that this sounds weird, but, like, let's remember this person's neurodivergent. And, like, we extend as, especially, like, right, like, I'm technically neurodivergent now because I have a brain injury, but, like, I'm more or less in every way, like, neurotypical other than, like, Mm -hmm. my, like, forgetfulness and stuff. Um, And I think it's just, like, a skill and an art of learning how to, like, have grace for that and, like, what grace actually means. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very fresh. It's like the same thing I run into. Like I've worked with a lot of homeless populations. Um, I really hate talking to like, for example, like, uh, I have like a couple of like people in like my extended family who are very, they're from like Toronto. They're very (laughs) bougie and they just love talking about like homelessness. And then like, so my husband actually grew up in a homeless shelter. Uh, fun fact. So he grew up, uh, his dad was the power Whoa. engineer. Yeah. So he wasn't homeless, but his dad was the power engineer and they had to live on site 24 seven. Um, and this homeless shelter had a bunch of different apartments because they had the homeless shelter that was like a drop in and stay overnight and, uh, giving people food three times a day on the first yeah. floor. And then the third, the second, third and fourth levels were apartments for different transitions of, um, care. And then like, I think they, conferred the third one to like staff that had to be available basically 24 seven. Yeah. And they had, it was, it's actually a pretty like interesting, um, program, but we like, we would have like my cousin over and we'd be like talking about homelessness. So there's this one homeless guy in our area. Um, I won't say his name or anything like this, but he has got like, <laughs> he's so funny cause he's got a fucking system. So he is huge like mm-hmm. jacked as fuck. Cause he does a ton mm-hmm. of steroids. And in, in my city, you can get uh, a pass at the downtown gym for free. If you are like, basically if like one of your main like residents, I forget how they do it, but basically they give homeless people free passes, which is great, right? They have showers there. You have some like yeah. a space to hang out. There's a pool and they can exercise and exercising is really, really good for addiction. Um, so it's a really cool program. So this guy, um, my city that I'm in, it has like some of the most, uh, it's, it's got some of the best, uh, homeless care in Canada. Um, within like four blocks, there's about five shelters that all give meals and all of like, it's, wow. it's, yeah, we have, we actually have people who move here from Vancouver who are homeless. Like they'll save up for a bus ticket to come to my city to get into the, like the system that we have here. Cause we just like have a good system though. The big con is I live really far North. So it's like. The winters are really, really bad, obviously. Oh, yeah. That must be hard for the homeless. Yes. Um, so this guy, we were telling my cousin about him. He basically, so if, you, if you're if you smart about it, all of the different shelters actually offer breakfast, lunch, and supper at slightly different times. So you, if you're quick, you can make your rounds to all of them. Um, so you can have like, <laughs> you can have like 10 meals in a day. So he, unironically, so he... He actually works too. So he works and puts all of his money into like steroids and drugs, which is like sad. But then he tours all the homeless shelters, gets fed from all of them, then goes to the gym in between all the meals and just works out and then sits in the hot tub the rest of the time. Um, And like, he'll just work every like, yeah, he'll like work every like, I think probably like every like six, I forget what it is for EI. I think you have to work every number of days. You need to do a certain number of hours. Mm. So he'll repeat that, do the number of hours that he has to do. Um, and then just kind of repeat. And he's huge. He's so jacked. Um, and it, he's, just, it's just funny to me. Like, it's just like, it's just a world of hopelessness but, okay. that like nobody thinks about. Like this guy doesn't want to not be homeless. He's very, very like, I've talked to him. He literally doesn't like he's verbatim said this. He's like, no, no, like this works for me. Like, this is great. I really enjoy my life. And I'm just like, you know, fair enough. And then you like tell really liberal people about this and they're just like, oh, it's really bad of you for like making fun of him. And I'm like, I mean, I'm not making fun of him, but it's like kind of funny that this guy is like homeless and just cycles and then works out and is literally the most jacked person I've ever seen. Like he's so ripped. <laughs> it's just interesting. I mean, I- <laughs> I think that's the issue I have is that I don't believe people that are like, I really care about the homeless. I was like, I don't know what that means. 
Like, I don't know what that means. Does that mean you volunteer? Does that mean you have, because I, 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 I do calls with people who work directly with the homeless and a lot of them come to me because they feel really guilty about wanting to stop working with them. Yeah. Because it can be a lot. And those people will follow them home. They deal with stocking issues, like the bad side of it. Yeah. Which is like, I meet a lot of homeless people that are fine. I used to live at a, I worked at a Kroger in Seattle and there was this homeless guy who was like obsessed with me. So he would come in and he was very big, like super tall, like over six something, six, four maybe, and huge. And he'd come in and he would just watch me my whole shift and smile at me. <laughs> and I would tell him, I'm like, and I would, I always confront people that look at me. So I'm like, what's up? And he's just like, I think you're beautiful. I was like, I know this hairnet really doing it for me. He's like, even with the hairnet. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to go like live a life or are you going to watch me through my whole shift? He's like, I think I want to watch you. And I was like, okay, that's fair. I'm um, super uncomfortable though. Right. And he was like, yeah, but okay, I'll walk around. I'll come back. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but he'd walk around, he'd come back, he'd watch me. And then when I would go to my car, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go home now. And you're not going to follow me to my car. Right. And he was like, I'm not going to follow you to your car. I just like to watch you. And I was like, okay. And I'd walk to my car and I, you know, my coworkers would know. And he never hurt me. He never laid a hand on me. He never followed me to my car. I don't know, but I'm also used to this. I'm used to people following me like puppy dogs. I'm used to people feeling safe with me because you're right. Like, I'm not going to call the fucking cops on you unless you feel like I need to. And I rarely feel like that. I've had really good interactions with homeless people personally. So I don't have any bad stories, but I also know that that could be a bad story for some people. But for me, I just thought it was kind of cute, but also kind of like so inappropriate, but also you're homeless. So there must be something interesting happening in your mind as well. So like, there's a lot of layers to this where I, I feel like I can see the humanity in it, but I can also see how my friends struggle or people that I do calls with struggle with homeless people. Or my friend was spit on by a homeless guy, but I don't have those stories. Right. I just have good ones. So it's very hard for me to even imagine, but I also like distance makes a heart grow fonder (laughs) type person. So I also am very like cautious with how I interact with people, but I think that there's something in my brain that just makes me go, oh, I know why you're acting like that. I don't know exactly literally why, but I know it's something different. And that makes me want to be more patient with you. So I have a question that I keep getting um, that I think you could answer maybe with your background. Um, Does PTSD and borderline, is that considered neurodivergent? Uh, I don't believe PTSD is, and I don't. So here's the thing. Neurodivergent was made by a journalist. It is not a psych term. Mm. It is a pop culture thing. Um, I actually think it's a valuable term, um, in the idea of it's like identified basically people who like their brains are working differently. Um, and so who qualifies as neurodivergent? It's like, it's not a clinical term. So I'm not going to like, I, I gatekeep clinical terms. Yeah. I gatekeep clinical terms a fair bit. Well, once it's non-clinical, I'm like, I don't know. I think words become what like society wants them to be. So I think it originally started for just, um, people who actually had different brain structures. So something that you could identify, Uh. which is why it was brain injuries, autism, and ADHD. Um, Mm. I don't, I don't know if there's as much strong, clear neural like correlates for borderline. So I don't I know if they're considered in, in ND, but I imagine depending on like the person that you're talking to, uh, they may or may not. Doesn't PTSD change your, the, stru- I always thought it did change your brain, I guess, but I don't know. So, okay, here's the thing. I kind of, full, yes. Okay. I've never gotten tested for ADHD and everyone keeps telling me to. They also think I'm autistic, which is really interesting. Everyone thinks everyone audience, online is autistic. It's very strange. The people, the people in my audience who actually do have autism, they're very much like, you understand me. You seem like me. You have all my habits. And I'm like, okay, but I don't know that. I also have a sibling who's on the spectrum, but like, I don't feel like I'm like them. But I also know I'm not like my people who are not neurodivergent in any way. So I know I have a really weird place of existing, but I know for a fact I do the best in neurodivergent circles. And usually that consists of people, and I probably do have ADHD. I think like my mom was told when I was younger to get tested, but my mom doesn't believe in those things. My mom doesn't even believe in my borderline. Right. So I run uh, in a reality where I have a lot of people telling me who I am. And I think ultimately I know that I think about things a little bit differently, but also not. I don't know. I'm sick of being told I'm different, but it also sounds like a pick me. Like I'm so different. But it is like there's something different about my brain. I know it because when I talk to people and I'm, I have to explain it a hundred different times and a hundred different ways for them to finally get it, it's like, fuck, was this me all along? But then I don't really want to talk like them or think like them either. So I refuse to like not be this. Right. So then I, I always place myself as, as neurodivergent personally. I think it fits me rather well, but I did not, but I, but I don't know if that's accurate. Right. And like... I can't say, obviously, I was somebody who's just like been talking with you. I'm pretty careful to not throw out labels at people. Um, Mm. 
Someone so, says I come across as manic, which is pretty interesting to me because I know what real mania is and I never, I always feel like I know the differences. You don't come across as manic at all, at all to me. What do you think that is? Why do people think I look manic when I know what mania is? And manic Britney is so different than this Britney. I think a lot of people think that they have more exposure to mental health than they do because we've like become so like laissez-faire with what mental health terms are that they're like, oh yeah, I like have lots of people in my life with mental health. And I'm like, no, you have a lot of people who self-diagnose themselves with mental health issues. Like mm-hmm. I'm not saying that they don't have mental health problems but they might have inaccurately diagnosed them so people might be like oh yeah I have lots of exposure with like bipolar but then if you like check it's like oh this person kind of self you know diagnosed themselves with borderline or bipolar yeah. and so all of a sudden like they're like oh yeah when that person was manic and then we like talk about it it's like uh like maybe it was hypomanic like maybe but like you know I've worked with clients who are diagnosed by a psychiatrist after rigorous testing and stuff like that and I've seen their mania and it's it's a very very distinctive thing um and so it it could be that um it could be that people like again it's kind of like how people are also loose with the words like when they're saying like oh you seem so manic they might not really mean it in like a clinical way they might just be beating it more like common parlance like oh like you seem like really hyper full of energy and like a little bit sporadic and spastic right um so there's like are are they meaning it clinically when they're saying it to you are they meaning it more like common parlance some people like man i just feel so adhd today it doesn't mean that like they're Uh, actually exhibiting like actual clinical levels of ADHD symptoms, but they are like scattered and distracted. Um, right. So the manic and bipolar, I hear a lot of like people being like, oh, my mom's like so bipolar. Oh, she's so manic. And I'm like, Actually, that, I that's not what those words mean, but fair enough, I guess. Yeah. It's so funny because the Middle Eastern people in my comments right now are literally like, Brittany, it's because like you're Middle Eastern or Arab or this is how we talk or this is like our family. Because it is true. Like everyone in my family is like loud and hyper and we talk like da 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 And we all talk to each other really loud and obnoxiously. And so it is kind of funny like listening to the idea that like, because for me, mania means something. So if my, that's why my inner circle is the only one who's allowed to tell me I'm manic and for me to believe it. Because they know what manic Britney looks like and they know what like healthy Britney looks like. They know what borderline Britney looks like. So they can be like, hey girl, are you uh we having a manic day and I'm like, oh, am I having a manic day? And then I'll like do my steps and like relook at myself and like examine. And I'm like, no, I think I'm just like in my feelings, which is different than being just like, cause sometimes I'll go downstairs and I'm like, I need to just like, scream and rant at you guys. And I need you to just listen. And everyone's like, okay. And they'll let me go on my tirade. And I'm like, whoo, I feel good. Hand me a joint. Thank you. All right. This felt great. Like it felt great. You know what I mean? Right. And so it's just like that relationship with these words, which is, again, I'm not trying to say you have to use words the way I use words, but if you're not going to use words the way I use words, then we're not going to be saying the same things, which is fine. Right. I think that's why it's nice to have open discourse with somebody that's like, oh, that's not how I'm usually, like when you said useless, when you said that's not how usually people use it, I'm like, "Uh oh, that's weird. And then I went like this, because like when I say it, everyone in my comments, they always write me after we talk about ones, people are always writing me like, how do people not know what ones are? And I was like, it bubbles. Like it's gotta be bubbles. It's gotta be exposure to bubbles. Cause like, there's, there's no way all these people write me and go, girl, I have a one. I know exactly what you mean. And other people go, what are you even talking about? Right. So instead of accepting that you haven't had the lived experience to give you this answer, people go, you must be really wrong. Right. It's interesting. Cause it's almost like in, in your bubble, you forget outside of it, what these words actually mean to like different, right? different groups. Totally. I don't, this is why I think ultimately that's why the levels aren't hierarchical. You always end up in a bubble. Right. Everyone lives in a bubble, even fives. Yeah. So I mean, neurodivergence is is definitely an interesting topic. Um, Mm -hmm. Especially because once we, this is why it's non-clinical, right? Because if we start getting into like the finicky things of the brain, like Mm. brains are plastic. So like arguably like every mental health disorder has some level of neurological correlate. And every, like every time you learn a new thing, your brain literally changes. So like, is everyone neurodivergent? Which is why like people try to say like neurotypical is a myth. And I'm like, no, neurotypical is a statistical norm. Like we can Mm. still make neurotypic typicality claims. Like that's why these things are somewhat useful, but I get why they get like gray, especially because neurodivergence is inherently a non-clinical word. Like clinical people don't use it. It's not something I've ever learned in psychology. I never even heard it until I came across it on TikTok. Like it's just not, it's not in the, yeah, it's not in the field like at all. Yeah. We don't even talk. Yeah. We would just talk about like specifically like the, in, in my field, we would talk about the diagnosis. Like if somebody was neurodivergent, we would say somebody with autism or 
the autistic person. Oh, like the specific thing. Yeah. That's what's so interesting about all these ways of communicating. Cause like I use, I talk this promise, ideology, culture, background, expectation of behavior, all of it changes. And even within our own communities, like class changes the expectation of behavior, education, you know, changes it. But then there's like the neurodivergency outlook or even, I don't know, I, I work really well with people who don't seem common because my brain just goes, cool, new thing to learn. What's, what's your thing? Tell me your thing. But I usually want them to tell me what their thing is versus me saying what their thing is because I probably haven't been exposed to it yet. So I think I'm, I'm, I would be so interested to see what the world would be like if we allowed people to let us into their world instead of letting them into ours. Mm-hmm. You know, so I always say when I talk to everyone, including you, I try to say I jump into your bubbles because asking people to jump into mine would be so rude. Like my bubble is not, it's of my own making. It's like not always accessible to people. So I tried to add, I tried to meet the language of the person I'm with, but obviously I fall short because I live in my own bubble. And so I always use the language I use. And I sit here and I'm like, oh, I have to translate. What do I have to translate? And then I'm like, oh my God, we always have to translate. Like, it's just fine. Right. And you're not super you know? interested in always like, like There's you said before, like with the neurodivergent and stuff. Like okay. you're not always actually like that motivated to um, fully like jump into the, like to communicate in the way that like what non, what may be like neurotypical is my communicate or something like that. Yeah, not traditionally. Um, the people in my life, I make a great effort for. The people not in my life, I make a very little effort for in that regard. I try to do my best. I try to learn. Like when I traveled around the States, I always tried to look up the city I was in, what the expectations were, how people dressed. <coughs> and then I try to meet those expectations. Like in Seattle, in certain places, I could dress a lot sluttier and feel normal. But in some places, I try to dress more conservative because I didn't want to stand out as a solo traveler. I was a female solo traveling. Like, I didn't really want to stand out. So I know what, like, code switching is. And I know what looking, blending and assimilation is. Like, I'm an immigrant background. My parents are immigrants. So, like, I know what it is to to look like another person that isn't you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so it's really, it's really interesting. Like I said, like, your level system is really interesting to me. A, I actually, I think Red Penny in my chat said it, but we've talked about this in my chat before that I think like your level system makes sense. Like I could understand a lot of autistic people finding it helpful um, Mm -hmm. because I think, I think in general, most like what I kind of see is like most people to some extent categorize people within their own head. Um, And the level to which you need to do that, I would say autistic people will probably need to do that the most because they have a really hard time in understanding the social world. So having a categorization system makes sense. The difference is that you've systematized your cat- your personal categorization system and now are allowing other people to use it if they would like to. But I would be really interested to see like if somebody else made another categorical system that is just subjectively helpful, right? Like a lot of people like confusion chats, so you don't claim that it's scientific. You don't try yeah. to claim that it's for everyone. You don't try to say like, yeah. this is an objective tool that just captures everyone and it's perfect. And like, there's no, it's just like, this works really well for me. And this is how I relate to the world and others. And it's helpful to me. Totally. Right. Totally. 100%. I'd be so curious to see like what would occur if more people systematized how they thought about others and then tried to like share about it basically. Um, Cause I imagine they would all be like mm-hmm. varying levels of like, Systems that people are going to have very different feelings about from very, very good feelings to very negative. But um, that was why I thought it was so interesting, like understanding how, like, this is why, like, when you were saying, like, our borderline neurodivergent, I'm like, I, first of all, the word is, you can make an argument that anyone with mental health is neurodivergent. I would argue the word is useless. (laughs) Yeah. I think the word's kind of useless at that point then, because like almost everyone, like, almost everyone will have some level of mental health problem at some time. So like, are they always neurodivergent Mm -hmm. or are they only neurodivergent when they're in that mental health thing? Um, I try to like mostly reduce it for when like somebody's got a brain different enough that like genuinely there's going to be miscommunication. Like that's where I think the word is really useful. That's why I think like capturing Mm -hmm. autistic people and ADHD people and people with brain brain injuries specifically can be really helpful with neurodivergent because literally Mm -hmm. like there are going to be like faults in the system. I would, I don't even know if I would consider most brain injury. It depends on the level, I guess, but for sure autism and ADHD, but yeah. borderline's a really interesting them. one because the way to interpersonally engage with somebody with borderline and the way that they imperson- interpersonally engage with others is very, very, very unique, right? Which is why, like, yeah. I'm really comfortable engaging with you. Like, I've worked with, I've had good friends that are borderline. I've worked with lots of borderline clients of different levels of recovery. Um, and I'm just very comfortable communicating with borderline people. Yeah. But now that I'm pulling myself out, I'm like, I'm realizing it is a skill as well, like, because I'm not borderline. Like, oh, I realize right. that I've, I've, 
taught myself a skill of like how, how to understand borderline people. Just like my dad's autistic. I have a skill in understanding Mm. autistic people. Like I just know when I'm talking to an autistic purple person, I actually like think about their words a little bit differently because I understand like most autistic people say exactly what they mean and only what they mean. And they don't mean anything beyond it. Um, and so you try, I try not to like read in to any implications because there aren't any, right? That's, that is the hardest part yeah. is like, don't assume ill intent on my end because I swear to God, you're just like, you're, I'm, then you're misunderstanding me and now you're making me out to be a monster and I never was one to begin with. And now it's causing me to be feel like crazy because that's, you know, borderline is like this fear of abandonment. And of course, if everyone thinks you're a monster, you're going to get abandoned. So that's why I rely heavily on my inner circle. After my whole stalker incident, I had to really like, purge and really reassess who I could trust because like people that I thought I could trust were like did you do this and like did I sex traffic women because like that was one of the accusations I was like no like that's so fucking outrageous like I'm online all day it's like saying literally when do people have time to sex traffic people if you're online all day like what do you think is happening you're in my life like people can see me like I I work a job like I work with children all day like what, what do you think I have time to do this so again, I feel like it's insane how the internet moves, but, and also it is just the internet. Cause like real life people absolutely see you every day. So they know you're not fucking doing those things. Right. But that misunderstanding is what's so scary for people who are different because like everything from even my facial expressions, people are like, oh, she's making a face. Um, I've had this problem since I was a kid. I've asked people since I was like a little kid, please do not think my facial expressions mean anything because sometimes my face just like twitches. Like I have twitchy, I have a twitchy face. Like I twitch my body. I'm even when I'm alone in my room, my face twitches certain ways and I don't want, it doesn't mean anything. Right. Do you, you know what do I you mean? fully just twitch or do you like have kind of this internal dialogue going on that may be l- more or l- less related to the conversation that like your facial express, like you're listening to somebody, but you're also thinking things and you might like think something unrelated to the conversation or related to the conversation yeah. and then your face will react. Is it more the latter or is it's it more just like you twitch? It's, it's, it's less, I just twitch because to be honest, even now I'm thinking of like three different things at the same time. Like I'm always thinking about three different things. I have a song in my head right now. I'm thinking about everything I'm going to do tomorrow. And I'm thinking about you. And I'm thinking about like, who could be watching. I think about like, there's always like 12 different lines of thought happening in my head. And I can, I feel like I can listen to all of them and not lose track of the conversation. So of course my facial expressions might be about this thing over here, but not about this thing here. So I could train myself to pay more attention to just like, just be in this moment present, but it gives me a lot of anxiety. Right. Or you could like be more like stoic in your facial. So just like react right. to less, but then like for borderline people, that's not exactly a good yeah, recommendation to make. Happen, girl. It's not going to happen. Sorry. Yeah. So like that's the thing. I try to be unapologetic. Like, look, I've worked this so, I've worked so hard to be this person to like recreate my career, to get my family in order to do all the things I need to do. The last thing I want to do is take away all the comforting tools I've been given to focus So like even my self-soothing, like to watch people in the comments of some live streams be like, she's so like, oh, look at her self-soothing because she's anxious. Like, and you could tell like it was like they're mocking. They're like, that's so funny. She's so nervous. She's going to get so like taken down right now. And I'm like, that's so funny that the tools I've been given to keep myself alive is worth mocking because in maybe non-neurodivergent circles or non-mental health circles, um, people just see them as like pathetic, which could be fair. If you judge it in a particular way, maybe it is pathetic. But from my perspective, it's like, do whatever you got to do, play with your hair, touch your scarf, like rub your hands, whatever you got to do to feel, to get through this conversation, do it. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a mixture of things going on in what you're talking about. (laughs) I think there are, for example, typically people who are like more progressive are going to be more accepting of mental health, um, Mm -hmm. and more like gracious to it. And then you just run into the issue where they're gracious to the idea of mental health, but not to the symptoms. So there's that group going on, but then there's another group who's fully aware of mental health. They just don't really give a shit. And they think it's kind of pathetic. Right. And they're kind of like, I get that it's Mm -hmm. mental health, but also like you could also just not be anxious. You could also just not do these things. Right. So there's kind of two camps in what you're talking about. Right. Like when people are like mocking you for anxiety, I don't see it as much of like this camp. It's probably more this camp of being like, oh my gosh, she's like so anxious, right? It's the same thing. I always got so mad whenever I worked with um, teen gang kids. Mm. They'd always do this thing where they'd punch at you, like fake punch to get you to flinch. And then be like, oh oh my gosh, you flinched. And I was always like, you do realize like, first of all, 
we're in a forensic setting. Okay. I know that you literally hurt people sometimes. <laughs> Second yeah. of all, flinching when you punch at my face is a very self-protective behavior. Like it is very wise of me to flinch. And they would try to like use it as like evidence of like how weak and like how anxious I was around them. And I'm like, no, you're yeah. punching at my face. Of course I'm going to flinch. I don't want you to punch my face. I also have TBIs. So hitting me in the head is a very different ball game than hitting somebody else in the head. Like you could kill me. Yes, right. Like, yes. yeah. And so it's just like, there's, there's kind of a couple things going on here when it comes to mental health. So like when it comes to like this group, that's just like basically insensitive, like they have no compassion for mental health. The conversation that we need to have with this folks is actually different than the folks who are compassionate to mental health. Mm -hmm. They just have no lived experience with it. And so they're actually very like, um, unsympathetic when it's happening to them because dealing with mental health is annoying. Like it's not fun. It's not fun to be a caretaker a lot of the time, right? Like depression when you're like, spouse has depression it's not like they're beautifully tragic and you just hug them and watch movies every night right. it's like a lot of time it's like irritability right especially in men like men often express their depression totally. through like irritability and externalizations and so it's like it's not fun right they often don't have any empathy for you like it's not fun it's not beautiful right. it's fucking right. messy and i think that this the mm. people on this side maybe just don't have experience with that as much um so they you don't have as much so grace funny. Like the the things I do with my face or the fact that like the other day I was on stream and I was like dancing to this song in my head and everyone's like, what are you listening to? I was like, the song in my head. They're like, literally, I was like, I can hear it perfectly. Every beat, every step, like every, I don't need music on. Like if the room is silent, I can still hear things in my head. Or I'm like, and I was a kid, people would see me and they'd be like, you need to get your daughter medication. She's being very weird. And my mom would be like, nope, she's fine. And so I didn't grow up with a mother or father that needed their kids to be proper. And like, unless you were in church. And so it was very strange, like coming from a, like a politically American conservative background where they don't believe in borderline, but they also know that their children are a little different, but they also don't see it as different. They just see it as like their child. Right. So like I was growing up really accepted, and even with the mental health. So I was talking to my bestie the other day and I was like, well, you know how you just There's smash a cup on the ground? There's only one type of eel? She was like, no. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, you know, sometimes people smash cups on the ground. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I grew up in a world where, like, if you got angry, like, whether you're throwing a tantrum because you're on the spectrum or because you're borderline or because you're angry and you threw a cup on the ground, everyone around you would be like, okay, are we done? Like, they wouldn't overreact. They wouldn't freak out on you. You tried to get them to freak out. But instead, they'd be like, I understand you're upset. I can see why you broke that glass. Versus other people would be like, I can't believe you're so abusive. You're so destructive. You're so toxic. Yeah, maybe in a relationship where someone breaks a glass, it could be toxic behavior. And another one, it could be you literally getting triggered and not knowing what to do. So as a form of control, you break a glass. You're like, look at me. I can break things. I have power and control for some strange fucking reason. Probably because there's a lot of borderline in my family that's undiagnosed, in my opinion. <laughs> we have a lot of abandonment issues in my family. <laughs> But, like, I feel like I look at my aunts and people that I talk to, and I'm like, I can see why these things happen. Like, given our culture and our background, I can see why a lot of us feel abandoned by our people. And then in another way, I can see there's a lot of abuse in arranged marriages. And, like, a lot of, you know, they're all really great people, and most of them are, have really managed their life in a beautiful way. But you hear these stories growing up, which made me so much more reasonable around people who are violent or loud. Like, I don't, I have a very high threshold for what's violence. You know, like I was with two girls that I was with, my polycule, and two of them got in a fight and one, they were really mad at each other and one bit the other one until she bled on her breast. And I just went, oh, someone's mad. And then someone else in the group was like, this is horrible. Like this, we should call somebody. I was like, why? They just had a fight. And she's like, I was like, you never seen somebody fight? And I was like, is this normal? And I was like, in this bubble it is. It's what life is to some people. That's the problem. It's like, I am, I didn't grow up in a sweet little cuddle, coddled world. Sorry. Yeah, it's very interesting talking to <clears throat> talking about mental health and abuse and stuff like that with people from different cultures specifically. So, for example, um, a good friend of mine for uh, that I lived with for a while was from was born in Mexico C City in like a pretty poor area of it as well. Uh, and another friend was I don't remember. It's, it's been a while since I've talked. To them. I think Nigerian. Um, <clears throat> and talking about like some of their experiences and like. There's things where it's like, okay, what is abuse? What is mm -hmm. cultural? And what yes. is, I don't care if your culture is different. It's still abusive, even if your culture says it's fine. Right. And I yeah. think all three of those things are true. For example, when I would talk with my uh, one friend, um, his mom used to switch him all the time and he had tons of scars uh, all across his back, but damn. he was like, my mother's not abusive. And how dare right. you? 
How dare you try to call that? And it was this weird thing where I was like, I get that, but I think this is incorrect. Like, I think, I think it's, I I think I'm not going to tell you you were abused or anything like that. But if we're like looking at the objective lens, I think I'm willing to just say like, it is kind of abusive and your culture is just kind of okay with abuse. Like that can, both of these two things can be true at the same time, which is (laughs) really weird to deal with. Right. And it's like, I'm, I'm in the view of like, I don't like that. I would never want to replicate that in my family. I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't think it's good for like family cohesion, but yeah. I'm not going to tell you that your mother abused you because obviously like fundamentally you get to label your own life experiences. Um, mm-hmm. right. And then I've talked with, um, my friend from Mexico city and we were talking a bit about trauma. And so like, mm-hmm. you know, he would go home and his dad would like hit him pretty much every day. And he was pretty willing to be like, oh yeah, my dad was really abusive, but it wasn't really, but he's like, it doesn't really distress me though. Like I, I, he's like, it's really weird living in Canada when people talk about like their abusive parents and stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, like parents being abusive, like it is what it is. Right. Um, and Mm -hmm. it's this element of like privilege that like in our society, like it's almost this element of like, it's so, our culture is so opposed to violence against each other, which I'm for, by the way, like I, I think that that is a good thing within our culture that I like. That like when somebody is physically violent, it's so, it's so different from our normal lived experiences that it is distressing to us. And so this isn't to say that people who in Canada have had abusive parents and say that they have trauma from it, that they're disingenuous. It's very, very true that they have trauma. I believe them. You get to label your own life experiences. But at the same time, this guy from Mexico City, he's like, oh, but like everyone's parents just hit them all the time. He experiences no trauma from it. He doesn't feel trauma. He doesn't feel upset, which is like, this is the weird thing of like, what's the difference between a trauma event and a trauma response? What is abuse? Can we call abuse objective? Like, this is why, like, we get into like these weird realms of like, can we say that this is abuse and your culture tolerates abuse? And so like, therefore, I view your culture as like, maybe not as great. Um, but I'm not going to tell you you were abused. Like this is where we get into like really, really weird territories because words like abuse and trauma and stuff have such moral weight to them as well. Right. But when I told my dad that I had PTSD, he was like, from what? I was just like, and then I eventually had to tell them like I was assaulted and I didn't tell anyone for a long time. And my, my dad was like, I don't think people get PTSD in America. And I was like, ah you mean because people don't get PTSD in Iraq? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, so in America, we're pampered in a large large way, so we can get PTSD very easy. Or we can go to other places and get PTSD for a lot of reasons. And my dad thought PTSD was only for soldiers. So he's like, well, you're not a soldier. And then my dad is trying to explain to me through a long conversation, this was years and years and years ago, we finally got to the point where I told him, you know, in Iraq, it feels like because he grew up watching like women literally like hide from their breasts and dragged by cars and like people being beheaded and our family being massacred, you know, by the hundreds, like just normal, like a normal every day. My, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, sorry, was like in the mountains hiding from Saddam's army while they would knock on the door, his, his, his uh, soldiers and like take my grandma for like three days at a time to jail or like he, they would come and the women would have to defend, you know what I mean? It was very, it's a lot to grow up with and that probably would traumatize a person here. But in Iraq, it was just called life. It was called Monday. Right. So my, you know, and life might be traumatizing, right? Because like sometimes when they come here, though, then they do start to. So it's like, mm. are they not traumatized or th- mm. is an entire cult- culture living in dissociation a little bit? Because that's also I possibly think a little true. Bit of that. Yeah. No, I think a little bit of that, to be honest, like I see it in my parents sometimes. My dad's really good at just shoving it all down, yeah. and, like being OK and which is not OK, but it is what it is. And then my mom has a tendency to just be a little flinchy. I'll see it subtly. She's very good at hiding it, but I'm like, oh, mom's getting flinchy. What's she around? Well, who's around? Like, I'll look and I'll see what's triggering my mom. And like, I'm like, oh, 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 oh. And I don't, again, we don't, we don't go to mental health professionals. Like my siblings, three of us had gone to therapy and we were the first ones in our family to go. And it was a big deal. Um, it was a really big deal. And so it's one of those things where it's hard to say, but I will say for their, I don't even think they need to work on it necessarily. That's the problem. It's like I had to work on mine. It was destroying my life. My parents are doing really great. Like I meet people like that all the time, though, that I meet. And I'm like, oh, I love your life for you. I mean, there's a different life they could have if they fixed a few things here and there. But do they really have to? Right. It's like the question that I always end up on. Yeah. And, and this is where we get into this like tricky realm where people like they're wanting to impose on others. Like, well, you know, they're just associating, which might be true right? Their mm-hmm. culture is just not allowing them to express their distress, which might also be true, right? But what if you ask the person and they say, I'm not traumatized, I'm not dissociated, and um, I'm just fine? Well, we can say, well, they're lying, 
potentially, right? So remove some of their autonomy. You don't know yourself well enough, um, which might be true. Or maybe they're not distressed for whatever reason. Some, right. some, right? And this is where I was like, I'm willing to say like certain events are inherently traumatic, but some people might not have a trauma response to it. And some might, right? So I would say rape is inherently traumatic, right? Being falsely imprisoned and like tortured, inherently, like it's a traumatic event. Um, Mm -hmm. War, traumatic event, um, right? And so I'm willing to call these things trauma events, but that doesn't mean that we should be imposing on other people. Like, how do you feel about it? Um, Because you can, you can remove people's autonomies and say, even if you don't, you say you're not dissociated, you say that you're not traumatized and you say that you're like fine with everything. I don't believe you. We can do that. Just doing it at the cost of saying by doing so you were inherently removing, like removing a level, a certain level of that person's like agency. Like you're basically saying Mm -hmm. you don't know yourself well enough. I know better, which like, again, you can do, but there's pros and cons to that too. Super triggering for me to hear it. I hate because I told my whole, I've been told my whole life, like you don't know yourself well enough. I know you better than you know any, like I, then you know yourself, um, like you're not gay. And I'm like, okay, but I'm telling you right now I'm queer. Like, I'm telling you, I like women. And they're like, nope, I know you better than you know yourself. And hearing that your whole life is really fucked up. Yeah. But that also happens with our mental health. I know Brittany. She's definitely manic. Okay, stop it. I already have my steps in place. I already have a therapist that I worked with. I know myself. And it is super scary. Like It is very scary to have people, especially in, like, mob tendencies in America. It's scary to say, am I going to become the thing the mob doesn't like today? And what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for my job? What does that mean for my ability to sell my time and do calls? What does that mean? Do I get the right to live life without the threat of like being, being unable to make like a living because someone's uncomfortable with me? Yeah. And this is where it gets tricky because a lot of times, like, for example, when we're trying to say to like um, my friend in Mexico City, like, oh, your dad was abusive. And he was like, oh, yeah, my dad was abusive but it didn't traumatize me, right? It's like, it almost feels like caring of us to say like, of course it was a little traumatizing, but it it's like, is that actually helpful? Or are you just yeah. removing people's agency? Like it makes, all it's really doing is making you feel better by like labeling yes. it to what you yes. feel is more accurate. And it's like, it's not, a, even if you're fucking right, it still mm-hmm. might not help the person. Like you might, they Absolutely. might be in dissociation. They might be in denial, but there's a reason they're in that state too. There's a reason why they're not willing to call something a trauma. There's a oh reason gosh, yes. and let people yes. have their journey. Like just let them have their journey. Yes. Oh, I have that all the time where people come up to me and they're like, oh, da 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 is doing this. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, do something. I was like, ah. if you go now, they're going to double down and hate you. And they're going to do the opposite. Or if you don't like, I know people who are like, oh, I broke up with blah, blah, blah. And this is why. And I'm like, that's not, that's not why you think that's why, but that's not why. And I'm mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm not going to correct them because they're during like in a breakup are not going to be able to hear there you had more responsibility in the breakup than you know they're not ready yeah so let them break up let them go their separate ways and then maybe in six months to a year we can be like so about that breakup (laughs) right you know because not everyone learns at the same pace i'm a very impatient person when it comes to myself but i usually have pretty good patience when it comes to others and a lot of it has to do with like i don't think i have the right to make people do things they don't want to Unless they're children. And even then, I have very squeaky, like squeaky ish feelings around that. Where I'm like, eh, like, but no, kids are basically that. Otherwise, when they're adults, it's like, it's when I have 18 year olds coming to me and being like, I want to get naked. I'm like, okay, let's talk about the consequences of being 18 and naked. Like, do you really want to be naked or do you think it's going to be fast money? Why do you want to be naked? Because, you know, maybe you want to wait till you're 25. Maybe you want to wait till you're 30. Maybe you want to wait till after you have a baby. Or maybe you want to wait till you meet your next partner. But I never want them to feel like, I have such a rigid way of thinking that, oh my God, no matter what happens, there's no situation where this is okay. I feel like you can always come up with something that has a contextual okayness around it, which is my struggle as like a person, because like what I do to feel better is not necessarily what other people do. Or like every time I told people I was suicidal, I didn't want them to help me. I just needed them to hear me. Right. You know? And helping me would have been worse. And I'm so lucky. I'm so fucking lucky that the people in my life did not 5150 me. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. Like that would have, because I would, I I have, I know I look strong and beautiful and tough, but I'm a pussy when it comes to being trapped. I just panic. Like I panic, I panic, I panic. Even COVID was really good for me because I have a trauma around having my face covered. And when I first started wearing masks, I would have panic attacks. Like, oh my God oh my god and then I was like I can't go to the store so like I can't go anywhere and so finally I'm at the stage now 
where I can wear masks, which is really good because this autoimmune disorder, um, I need to wear masks places now and I need to wear clothing from the sun so I can't be exposed to the sun. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad COVID sort of came into my life so I could work through that trigger. Mm. Before I would, I had, I had a panic attack at King Fest girl watching a demonstration of people wearing masks, other people wearing them. I'm sorry. Where does the, you don't have to obviously say this. Where does the mask trigger come from? From my assault. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've, my face was smothered. And so now I have this like association with just, if my face is smothered now, the thing like it just, I can't. Yep. That makes sense. I can't. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, but now I'm getting better at it. I really hope cause BDSM has some cool ass leather masks. I'm really trying to get up to the point where I can be in one. And actually, um, my, my therapist knew about this, but even prior to getting a therapist, I knew I had a problem around it. Cause my friends didn't know I was assaulted, which I kept secret for my own reasons. But I told my friends, I have trauma around a trigger. Can you help me? So I had this one partner at the time, um, BDSM partner, not romantic sexual partner, just a BDSM partner who would help me. He'd have all these masks and I would practice just putting it up to my face. That would be our scene. And then, you know what I mean? And it was really helpful, um, but I have yet to be able to do a full, not there yet, but one one day. That's fair. Okay. Um, your, Your experience with BDSM is like incredibly interesting to me. Um, Good, I'm glad. (laughs) Yeah, I, I just think it's, it's very, it's like a community like your experience with it, because like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to paint BDSM right. community as like perfect and that there's no bad apples and that bad things don't happen, right. blah, 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 obviously. But for your experience, it's basically been like a space of healing and con- and confrontation of like your own demons, um, mm-hmm. which is really cool and important because especially for somebody with borderline and with PTSD, you have to. Uh, you have to be, and like, this is something I don't think a lot of people realize is like, um, most of us skate by with never confronting our demons. Um, and we're kind of sad and miserable, but we're like functional and we can get by and like things are okay. And like hockey's cool or something like that. You skate to hockey or whatever it is. Um, but like the most Canadian thing you've ever said. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's funny. I really don't like hockey. I don't watch it. Not a fan actually. Anyway. Yeah. It's pretty boring. Uh, There's lots of good fights, though. You know, there's a lot more violence. So if you're into, like, the fighting, hockey might be your thing. Um, But, like, actually, like, looking at your demons, like, in the face um, and having them, like, look back and, like, going forward anyways, like, I would argue, like, one of the bravest things people can do. I mean, there's other brave things you can do as well. But, like, yeah, it's just really interesting. Um, Your experience with BDSM is essentially, like, being brave in the face of, like, things that are scary like that's like kind of what your bdsm is i'm really lucky too like i'm and even my weed like when i smoke weed when i'm not having fun it's for that purpose too going to a place meditating going to a place to face i have an obsession facing my demons i also have a deep-seated fear that i'm the monster in the story and so like i'm always paranoid about being that person because i know i'm so capable and so and not really emotionally capable but i mean you know we all have bad moments so like I always try to keep myself in check and that's why I think I reference myself in third person a lot is to reference that like there are different parts of me and I do want to face all those parts of me so I can truly say I know myself in a very intimate way so I can convey that person to my partners, to my friends, to the people around me so I can know what to do in situations. I think I just I really want to know what to do and I'm not going to know what to do if I don't know myself. So I think my whole life is always going to be a journey of me knowing myself and having a relationship. Like even yesterday, I was kind of like on the verge of tears with a friend where I was like, oh my God, I cannot predict the future. And he's like, nope. And I was like, no, like, listen, I know I'm not going to be this Brittany in five years. And I, I'm planning for all the different ones. Am I going to be partnered and have a baby? Am I going to be single and having a retreat center? Am I going to be having a retreat center and partnered? Am I going to be having, like, there's so many Britneys that get to exist and I can't predict the future. So I have to plan for all of them. And it is the most exhausting thing. I think a lot of people just live their life and go, ah, figure it out tomorrow. But I don't do that. My brain goes, no, Brittany, we know. We are literally capable of being all of these Britneys. Which one are we going to move towards? And I, I can't pick one. I have to pick all of them. Which is like, in case anything happens, I'm prepared. I just want to be prepared for my life while accepting that uh, plans change, but goals hopefully never do. You know? Yeah. 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 I want to be a good adapter. I want to adapt really well. Like, life is really chaotic. Look at Ukraine and Russia. Like how many people I know who like had plans to go to Russia to see their fiancés and they can't now or go to places to see their friends and they can't or people in Ukraine who have like you can't predict what the fucking government's going to do tomorrow. Right. 
So we have to be very just like aware, I think. And I, I, I don't, it's not comfortable. I think people prefer to be comfortable, which I, which is why, again, it's not my business if people are comfortable. Yep. It's just my business if they are, they think, I think what happens, they think I'm trying to threaten their comfortability. And I'm saying, it's not about you. This is about me. Sharing the levels and sharing my ideas is not meant to make people uncomfortable. It's meant to give a place for people like me who are born uncomfortable. are trying to be comfortable. Yeah. So I think most people are born comfortable and make do. And I just, I've never, I was never, I've never been comfortable. And yeah. I'm looking to, except until now. Yeah. It's very, it's interesting. I think when I, like a lot of people that I talk to that are online mm-hmm. a lot are like, man, like people are like really messed up. Most of them have like lots of trauma. Most of them are like rejects. And I'm like, no internet people are like this. Like there's a whole world of just normies who just like have yeah. normal experiences. Like, and I know that seems frustrating and dismissive, but it's like, it's possible to just like raise a child to have a good relationship with it, to have a pretty healthy yeah. family and for that child to have like a pretty good life. And that's it. And that's actually really exciting because it's like, fuck, there's nothing I would love more. Like I really enjoy my life. I also would love to give my kids the opportunity to just like, just like walk away from their child and be like, yeah, there was things that were tough. Like oh, everyone has tough stuff, but like there wasn't yeah. like this marker of being like, yeah. And that event changed me. And I had to like wrestle with it for the rest of my life. You know, like I would love to be able to give my kids that, which I obviously can't control because sometimes shit happens at school and sometimes shit happens outside of your control as a parent. Yeah. Um, but like, People do have like, when I'm saying normal, I guess I'm saying like broadly positive, like people have neutral to mostly positive lives. Whereas a lot of people I think online have broadly like neutral to negative lives. A lot of the time they go through a lot of distress. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of rejection. They have a lot of like loneliness. Um, A lot of them also have trauma. Um, And it causes us to think like everyone in this world is like that. And I don't think that that's actually true. I think like there are people in this world who grow up, they have a neutral to positive life for the most part. Things yeah. get sad. They go through grief. They have tough stuff, but there's nothing that you'd mark and be like, that's a trauma event or like, this is obviously yeah. like a really negative, sinister thing that's happened in their life. Um, Don't worry. When they get online though, they'll start being called, told they're like privileged and spoiled and then they'll want trauma. So they can be a part of that community. <laughs> I'll probably that's just like get offline. Of yeah. Oh, so that's the irony. I work, I sometimes people call me and they go, I think something's wrong with me. I was like, okay. And then I'll listen to their story. I'm like, hey, congratulations. You grew up perfectly normal and healthy. And they're like, what? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, what does that mean? I was like, just means you're one of those people. What's that like? And they're like, yeah. Like even in in my own sibling group, there's farm brother and farm brother has no mental illnesses, no fucking trauma. His life has gone pretty fucking well. And even the things that haven't been good are so normal, bad that I'm like, what's that like? And he's like, how did we end up in the same family with totally different lived experiences? I was like, because we are different people, my friend. Yeah. You know, and it's true. Like his life is so good. It's so exciting to see it. And I love that for him, but he doesn't have any problems. Yeah. Which is, which is based by the way. Like I hope that for my kids, I really do. But also like sometimes like it can be hard to relate to people who haven't like had like those other like negative experiences. It's like, like, I don't know. I just like, I don't want to like moralize. I I don't want to moralize people's journeys. I think we can maybe moralize their actions and certain things like that. But like, yeah, no, when I hear people say, like, oh, I've never thought about killing myself, I'm like, what the, f- why? How? How did you go your whole life without thinking about dying? And, like, that's amazing to me, and I think that's beautiful, but I think that's also the issue I take when people look at me, because I've spent my whole life wanting to die, that I'm like, how did you, and, and attempting, so I'm like, how do you want to live? And then, like, that was so interesting to me, is to meet people who wanted to never die. And I'm like, whoa. Because even now, I'm like, I'm tired, boo. I just want to go to sleep sometimes. But obviously I've chosen to live. Like I haven't tried or thought about killing myself in a few years now and I don't plan on it. I have no reason to think I'd go back there, but I couldn't have done that unless I did it my way. The world didn't, the world was very bad at giving me the tools to stop wanting to die. Look at the world around us, constantly telling us everything is awful and America sucks and the world sucks. Well, if it sucks, why are you so mad that people want to die? Yeah. Like that's what's so confusing to me. You can't tell me the world is awful and one in four women will get raped and then give us an incentive to be like, but you should still want to live. It's like, like i don't know Mm. interesting like that the the concept of of wanting to just like of somebody just enjoying life and not wanting to die is like so far from you like you like have a hard time understanding it i have no idea what that's like i appreciate learning about it like farm brother he gets to tell me what that's like and that's fun but like i have no idea what that's like personally yeah yeah 
so funny. Do, is that weird? Like, do you hear that? Because I know people hear that and they go, Brittany's crazy still. But I feel like it's really rational to want to die. I feel like in a lot of ways it is. Because, again, if the world, if you're processing the world, especially as a teenager, as a place you will never be able to be happy or free, what is the incentive to existing? I don't understand. What do you mean by never being able to be happy and free? Like because of your mental health? Is that what you're talking about? No, because of being gay or being gay in a place where you can't get married and people might kill you. What if you're the next Matthew Shepard? What if you're going to be like, you know what I mean, tortured and then killed against an iron fence and then, you know what I mean, left to die by yourself? Like, it's like one of those things where I, I was so young and I knew I was gay that I didn't have time to ever have a life where I didn't know that. Some of my earliest memories, I just knew I was an oddball. And I've been told my whole life, you're weird. Oh, you're weird. Oh, you're different. Brittany's different. Even in homeschooling groups, people would complain about me. Oh, Brittany seems different. She's argumentative. She fights back. She has problems with authority. So I've been told my whole life, like, the world's not made for you. So I made my own. And then even that's not allowed. Which is sort of like the kind of, and I'm fine with it now. Like, mentally, I'm at peace with it. But it does, it is like, I am trying to hold the world accountable a little bit the way they claim to care because they're sure not compassionate when it comes to the true the true outliers yeah interesting yeah Yeah, definitely i think i think a lot of people like all of this tragedy is real and then i think like a lot of people a lot of people go through and are to some extent like sheltered and don't like aren't aware that and our brains are very our brains are very self-protective, right? So like if mostly your life is going good and like things are copacetic, like things are good enough, um, your brain is going to be like pretty motivated to like not fixate on like really tragic things in life as well. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. Because like how do you wrestle with that? Um, And so I definitely can understand what you're saying of like, especially for somebody with like mental health or like queer and stuff like why do you want to live and it's like well like life can be really really rough sometimes and so like that's where like i think it's an individual like you have to find Mm -hmm. you have to render meaning into your life and like that's not an easy like i'm not saying this in like a dismissive way like i mean like you have to take tragedy and suffering and you have to like wrestle from it some level of like joy and meaning that you can have in your life because like what else is there like that's a lot of time yeah. like where we come back to it's like what else is there like you have two choices like you can just die which i'm not advocating for or you can try to like render meaning from stuff and like that that's kind of where that's where some people are at in their life other people are not there yes. but like a lot of people that's really where they're at i can like kind of die or i can try to like wrench some meaning from this life um which i think is kind of the beauty and tragedy of like being alive essentially Mm -hmm. um yeah absolutely no that's exactly what it is which is why when people come to me for our calls and they go hey I've done all this work I've like got a job or I've gone to therapy and everything seems well but I'm not content I go great let's start making the world where you are what do you want from life like why do you want it what do you need like these are not things that your teachers help you with or your therapists help you with or your doctors like my I have a nutritionist now to help me and I have a doctor. My nutritionist and my doctor have completely different skill sets. My doctor doesn't know shit about nutrition, and my nutritionist doesn't know shit about how, like, the lupus is working and the inner, like, inner stuff. And so it's like, okay, fine. So I go to my doctor for the things that they need to help me with, and I pay my nutritionist for the things. And I think society is obsessed with thinking we, we're all, like, jack-of-all-trades or masters of, like, we're not. Some of us just don't know how to do everything, so we have to go to different people for those things. And I feel like one of the things I'm really good at is radically accepting the world for what it is and then radically accepting that there are loopholes in the system and you can absolutely find your joy and happiness and your reason for existing in the loopholes but they are loopholes it's me like look i have um i just got rejected from a bunch of life insurance plans because i have borderline and ptsd i accept it i'll find a different way to find a you know a nice little retirement whatever i'll invest in stocks or some shit then um i want to adopt a kid okay so what if they look at my thing and go she has an autoimmune disorder and now or borderline and ptsd and she's a single mom and she works like on OnlyFans and Patreon. We're not giving her a kid. Fine. I'll have my own kid. Well, how do I have my own kid? Who's going to give me that kid? Well, I don't believe in like IVF and surrogacy and in vitro and stuff like that. I don't believe in all that stuff. It's fine if you do it. I don't care. It's not a moral. I'm not morally judging you. I'm just, Brittany's too hippie for that. Like you so don't I'm want, like, when you're saying I don't believe, like you don't want, you, that's not what you're interested me. in. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. I feel like the best way to serve a community is to adopt a child who is needed one. Not to make a new one. 
Right. But if you're going to, and if I'm in love, I'll make a new one, I guess, because that's a product of love making and that's a product of us together. But that's, I'm most likely going to be a single mother. And I have a great support system. I'm making tons of money. I'm going to make even more money. I'm going to buy my house. Like, I'm doing all the responsible things. But if I don't look the way they want on paper, which is fair, I know you don't want to give kids to just anybody, but there is sort of not a place. Like, if it was a queer, neurodivergent adoption agency, I feel like I'd have a much better chance of being a mom. Right. Right? Yes. Because I'd have the access to them understanding, like, I want kids, and I particularly want kids with disabilities. I want kids who are neurodivergent. I want kids who are struggling. I want older kids. I want particularly, like, the biggest rejects. I I don't care if you have medical history. I don't care if we're at the hospital every day. If I can make the money, I want those kids. Because those kids are the ones who are going to end up in the system. They're going to end up homeless on the street. They are the ones being rejected. And I don't need a baby because I love, I my love is so Fast that I've never seen an issue with any way that I see a child, whether they're 15 or two. Right. So I don't, I'm indifferent. I feel like I'm the perfect brain for adoption because I literally connect to everybody. So I'm like the perfect versus I've met some people and I'm not judging this who cannot adopt because they'll never see that kid as their own. I'm not that person. Right. Like I'm the best person for adoption. So let's see in three years if they give me a baby. And if they don't, then that's one, another way that I'm looking at the world and thinking, Sorry, what's the incentive to being here? Okay, the incentive is what I make it. I will accept it. So I've decided as a loophole, if I can't have my own kids because the system won't give me one, I will allow my retreat center to be an open space for mommy and me, parent and me events. And I will allow children to come and be on the petting farm and see kids and I'll participate in that kind of a way. Yeah. Because like there's a way around that. I won't be a literal mother, maybe, but I could be sort of like a auntie. Okay, so when you're saying a loophole, you're kind of talking about like a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, because like they, well, instead of going into despair and saying they're not going to give it to me, it's the end of my world, it is the end of the world you created or thought you would have. Mm-hmm. It's the end of plan A. Okay. And I cried about it and I'll pre-mourn, very stoic of me, I'll pre-mourn all of my like possibilities so I can get over it. When it happens, I'll accept it. It's very hard for me because I know I've meant to be a mother. I hate it. I hate that I know I'm. this is the one thing that's going to fulfill my life and the world might not let me do it. And that's so weird. Yeah. It's so, I kind of hope if I get married, they're not neurodivergent so they can be the normal person on the application. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even just being married is going to help, but like, yeah, I mean, that's, that is a reality, right? Because like the heuristic that they're using borderline is probably going to be the main one that they're using and being like, uh, and it's not a, like the reality is like there's a lot of people with borderline who don't get treatment and don't like manage it well and like might not be suited for parenting. And so it's like this like really right. shitty heuristic where it's like this is what they're using. It probably it's it's their bare minimum of like we're just going to be conservative and say these things can't have kids because, you know, if there's a predictive rate of like maybe maybe even 20% of the time this might turn into a bad situation. We don't really want to deal with the 20% of the time. We don't even want to risk it. We're just going to use this heuristic, which is like, this is why like bureaucracies are shit, right? So they make like general policies that are very reductive and don't take into the nuance of like Brittany, who has been in treatment. She's like, um, very aware of her, of her borderline. She actively, um, manages it, takes care of it, is aware of her triggers, right. is preventative in, cause that is how you treat borderline is you're preventative in nature, right? You take care right. of yourself. Um, right. yeah, that's really, yeah. I'm, that's really shitty. I'm really sorry. Well, what I'm really concerned about is the fact that they're not looking at the statistics of kids staying in those systems. They're, like, almost three times more likely to end up in prison if they don't get adopted out. They're ending up on the streets and homeless. They're being molested and raped in these systems. So I don't understand how me, with, an like, more than a structure, like, my family is much better off financially than we've ever been. We have beautiful homes and a beautiful family. I actually think that the way I'm going to actually get this to happen is by bringing in, like, therapist notes and bringing in neighborhood notes and making it clear that I'm a community member. Because I am. I love my neighbors. My neighbors all know me. I'm, like, that weirdo that takes bread to people. I force Middle Eastern food down people's throats. It's like my rule. Like I will convince people to be less afraid of Middle Eastern people by feeding them. <laughs> what what food should I eat? Oh my gosh, what do you mean? What food can I make you, girl? Like what kind of food can I make you? Uh, I feel like do- yeah, dolma yeah. is always the thing I tell everyone to eat. Go to because every supermarket has it now. Tabuli or dolma. Or they call it, I think they call it tabbouli in these stores with a B. My people say it with a P. But like tabbouli, it's like a parsley salad. You'll find it in every safe way that has Middle Eastern cuisine, Mediterranean. And then grab um grab dolmas. So like grape leaves stuffed with rice and beef. Okay. Preferably, I like savory and warm ones, but in Seattle, they serve them cold and sweet a little bit, which is interesting. 
So like those are always the best foods to start. My, when my mom has guests over, the first thing she makes for people is dolma because it's the most like widely accepted. People love it, and you can make it vegetarian. Okay, interesting. I'll have to see. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to yeah. see if our supermarkets in, in not in my small town, obviously, but in the city yeah. have it because um, I'm trying to think. I think we have a pretty burgeoning. Um, Middle Eastern, but I'm not sure what major populace is, is kind of growing. Um, yeah, my my main city has a lot. We took in a lot of Somalian refugees for a while. So there's a <laughs> lot of Somalian cuisine. Um, and then um, lots of like Chinese. But I, I think there's only, I don't even know if there's, there's probably only like one or two Middle Eastern restaurants in my, in my city mm-hmm. that I can think of. Most of them are like North African. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I just had Ethiopian for my birthday and it was my second time having it. But like, I was eating, first of all, in love, love Ethiopian. Holy shit, it's so good. But I was eating it and I was like, oh, and I sent a picture to my mom. I was like, bro, it's basically Ardis and Maraca, which is just like soup. We have like, I feel like there's just a region of the world where we put everything in like a tomato based soup. And like, we all dip our bread into it. And that's like a universal thing we all do. And so that is something that I just love when I go to different places that are not even connected to me, but they're kind of similar enough and I'm like girl similar spices similar curry similar yeah. everything I love that that's my favorite thing about existing is like if I and I do think of it as existence like I'm constantly reminding myself I'm alive because it's very easy to forget we're alive especially mm. when you're busy like thinking about Netflix or Kardashians or even YouTube drama it's like this isn't living this yeah. is just like a part of existence so I try to remember that I am existing and that there's so many things that we can try and and, and participate that's why I like I will try Tell me what it is. I will eat it at least once. At least once. Oh, even if it eeks me out. Because you just never know. Someone must be eating it for a reason. Somebody must be doing it for a reason. I have. I always assume if someone's doing something, there must be a reason. And I want to know what it is. Versus assuming it's so outside my comfort zone that it must be icky. Yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting. I really like what you said about the I'm alive thing. Because that's something I've struggled with a lot my whole life. Because I kind of say that I am the archetype of a straight white male. Um, very career oriented, high productivity, um, very big about like climbing the business hierarchy. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't rest. I don't take my dog for a walk. We train, you know, (laughs) like there's Uh, no, there's no, you know, like if I'm playing a video game, which I rarely did until COVID, it's like a game that's like strategy where I'm like learning. And then I've also got like probably a Harvard lecture on in the background because I'm like, I've got to be improving in some way. and Right. Uh, and then I realized that I was never content uh, and I was kind of miserable and it made it miserable to live with me. Um, so contentment, the like, I hear I'm alive as like contentment. Um, yeah, and it's sure. really, it's really, I had like what I would say, like not, not a relapse, but like I had um, at the beginning of May, like kind of three negative things all happen in one week. Um, and one of them was really, really like upsetting and disappointing And I kind of like lost it. I've been like in a really content state since about, I'd say like November, December, um, Mm -hmm. just like in my own journey. Um, And it's been really amazing. It's been like so nice to just be like, I'm just happy. I'm just content. I'm just walking my dog and she can, you know, fuck around and it's fine. You know, as long as things are safe, like I don't want my dog like attacking people, but um, it's, it's easy to lean into I'm alive when things are good and nice. It's really yes. hard to leave into I'm alive when things are shitty. And I realized that when something got shitty, I immediately went back to not being content, just not at all wanting to lean into I'm alive. Because if I lean into I'm alive, I have to deal with all of the feelings um, yeah. that come with that negative thing and the disappointment and re- frustration and embarrassment and stuff like that. Um, and I think we like, we forget that, that like, when we like talk about mantras of like, just like lean in and like have joy. It's like, it sounds great. Um, but that also means that you have to lean into like embarrassment and you also have to lean into like just being disappointed and not being enough. Um, you have to lean into those things, uh, because sometimes, um, sometimes you're not enough. Like sometimes you do your best, you've done everything you can. Um, and you still get rejected for the job. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes you try as hard as you can, but your partner's just over it. And you get divorced anyways, even though you really want things to work out and you're really trying, they just don't want to anymore, right? Um, it's really hard to lean into I'm alive in that moment. But if you don't lean into it then, it makes it so much harder to lean into it when things are good too. Yeah, I actually, um, one of the things that I practice, I don't know if this is going to make sense, so I'm going to explain it and you're going to translate. But basically I like move through my day and I kind of have a shelf in my mind. I do, I like shelf 
in I like shelves. So like I have this one shelf carries all my emotions and one shelf carries all of the things that I need to work on. So sometimes I'll let the shelf kind of like gather too many jars and I'll look over my, oh, my bad, open a jar, move through it. Why, why, why? Oh, examine, thank you. And put jar where it needs to go on the right shelf. And I do that and I declutter my brain. And so when I go through my day, if I've let it, there's like a threshold. If I get too close, I know it's going to lead me to like a trigger. Right. But when bad things happen, it adds a lot of jars. So sometimes like I'll get a message from someone and be like, hey, I just got in a car accident. Can you come get me? It's 2 a.m. And I'm like, oh my God. So like 30 jars just got thrown on that thing that I have to like decompress later. And so what I noticed in the past is I'd let them like basically boil up to the point where they were smothering me and I wasn't breathing anymore. And so when I can keep them kind of at peace, because I have a lot of people that I take care of, like in different ways, and I have to always be ready for something to go bad in their life. So I've, I have a responsibility to myself to stay on top of it so I can always be there to help other people. Because if I'm not on top of myself, how can I help other people, right? So I've actually, my women's business group I'm a part of, um, we had homework this week and it was uh, to share our relationship with money and what we heard growing up. And I had this huge breakthrough that I never thought about before. Um, but I feel really bad spending money on myself, like really guilty. Cause I was like, how am I going to buy a house? How am I going to have a kid? How am I gonna... And I'm spending a lot of money on this nutritionist. And I realized like, I, they've been told like spending money on yourself, whether it's for therapy or college or anything is a scam. For life. Because like, it's either a tool that gets you somewhere or if it's just a scam. Versus now I look at it as a tool that I can use to either get me money or get me nothing. But the nothing could also be just like the experience. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. That yeah. Totally sense. So I don't know. A lot of it has to do like I just feel like really I've taken on the dog side. Like my dog does this. <sighs> and like I was like, oh, I got to do that every time I feel overwhelmed because he just like sighs away his worries. Yeah. I can see it in him. And so I do that. And so sometimes I go sit outside with him. He's my brother's dog, but he lives with me. So we go outside and I have like a forest as my backyard and we'll just sit there and look at the trees and like look at him and we'll listen to the birds. And sometimes we'll hear neighbors and we're like, oh, what's that? And it feels so good to just not have my phone and not worry because I know that the internet will survive for 30 minutes without me all. And it's actually my audience props to them because they give me that time. Yeah. They give me so much space to like, recharge my spoons and I couldn't have I couldn't I don't feel pressured by them at all I feel I feel really safe with them actually to like let me just hey guys I'm sorry sorry I'm out of spoons today I can't and they're like of course we understand I get it it's not like I'm being punished but in the past I would have felt so freaking bad and I still feel bad to an extent I find myself going back into my old habits but I work on it so you know what I mean does that yeah yeah it does make sense um it's been really interesting streaming because um, I think somebody quoted me I, 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 in my Discord as saying this, but like a large reason why I stream is because I'm really big about community. Um, mm, yeah. And it seems like streaming and being live and like having this personality also builds like a, a community around it. Um, mm -hmm. right? Like I love my community. Like I love just like going into my Discord and they're like singing karaoke or like watching movies Cute. together. Um like, it's just, Same. it's so meaningful. And so, like, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm curious what you think about this. Like, when it comes, like, I was on a panel about online hate and stuff recently. And I'm like, definitely when you're in social media, like, you get a disproportionate, like, when things go bad, they can go real bad. Like, it's hard, yeah. right? Um, which is why, like, but, but there's this offset of, like, things can go really bad. And if you unplug for two weeks and then come back in, everyone's forgotten already and moved on. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, like, this trade off of, like, I don't know what I have noticed. Like the thing I'm most nervous of now that I'm streaming more is mostly like people are so positive towards me and so encouraging. And they like, look, I feel like some of them look up to me a little bit too, that I'm always afraid of disappointing them of being like, Oh fuck. Like I'm going to fuck up and I'm going to be like, I'm going to be so sorry. And I don't know how I'm going to like, I'm actually like, it feels like I'm overwhelmed with the positivity and I like, don't know what to do with it. Um, mm. and I'm not going to say like, I'm traumatized or like distressed it, but it, like, it is kind of distressing. Like I, I, I've, I've had moments of like pretty high, like anxiety and stress of just being like, Oh no, like what if I messed up? And then like, my husband will be like, it's fine. Like just correct it. And I'm like, yeah, but like, what if I'm disappointing people? Like, what if I like, yeah. you know, um, which is like this weird, it's such a privileged job um, that when I get the hate, I feel like I'm like, well-deserved. My job is so cushy and so nice. And like, 
I'm so privileged that like when people are like, wow, she's probably like a narcissistic bitch who like is There's faking all of her degrees. Of I'm meal. like, okay. You're incorrect, but honestly, fair enough, you know? Maybe maybe the hate we get online is our version of having to commute because I don't leave my house at yeah. all. I don't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> that's a good one, actually. I haven't, that's a good one. Our hate online yeah, is, is the alternative because you're right. I'd have to commute an hour there and back oh, if I was working. I could not. I so, I'm so grateful I don't have to leave this house. Like, I even have to go run my car on purpose because I never drive it. And I'm like, okay, go to Walmart or something. Do something. Go to the flower shop or something. But I, 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 in the past, was really afraid of disappointing people. But I think the way my brain processes it now is um, um, disappointing myself for not adhering to my values. Because mm. often what will happen is the people who send me like that hate of like, oh, you're a narcissist, or I got one that's an erudite, he's right through you, she's just being nice to you. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to assume that's not true, because that would really, like really fuck with me. I hope not. Like, I hope you're not on this, some secret campaign where you're keeping track of this Britney video you're going to make to take me down next year. <laughs> like, you know, so that's, like the, that's like the fear all these YouTubers have. Like, all of us are just like, is this it? Is this a new friend? Or is this a new enemy? Is this a new person? Is this a new, mm. it's scary, but I'm going off of faith and I'm going off of like energy. And I'm going to assume that my energy reading on you is right. And that you're actually just like a really cool person and your voice has been really balanced in this space. And that I will deal with as much hate and misunderstanding of who I am as long as I stay within my values so I can best make friends and operate within a reasonable way. Like one of my one of my patrons, you know who you are, bitch. He's <laughs> always doing this thing where he like puts me on this really great pedestal and I love when I like he's like, I think Brittany could have done it. And I go, take me off that pedestal. I cannot do what you think I can do. And he's like, but I, I know you can, you're amazing. And I was like, I'm not that amazing. Like I'm a person, I have limitations. And I really wish people could see me for those limitations without it ruining my chances of being also respected. Yeah. That's super fair. Mm -hmm. That's just like, this is that job. Look, as long as no one fucking tries to take away my wallet, my presence on YouTube, I try to follow TS to the T, as long as I can maintain a space here, I will always feel safe in my audience and in my space here. Yeah. And I actually, I told Destiny, like, I'm open. If he wants me to come on his live show with, like, Chud Logic or whatever, and I will answer every question like I did for you, the dilemma is I don't think they have the skills you have. Just <laughs> to hear me, they just want to, like, find out I'm wrong on something. And so the issue is, like, I am very subjective. I really wish people would believe me when I said that. I really mm. wish people would just believe me when I say, like, guys, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm literally winging it as much as anyone else. But, I mean, sure, you can hold, hold me as serious as you want to take me. Right. Right. And it's, it's interesting with the online hate I've been noticing because I'm very big on like, if there's a pattern of critique, it might be worth looking at. Right. Cause it's like, mm. not all critique is bad. Even if it's really like vitriolic, right. If there's like a pattern of like, Hey, you're doing this thing wrong. Right. Like I released one video and I was like munching loudly on crackers and everyone got like upset. Right. <laughs> and at first I was like, fuck you guys. Like quit being like, like, so like sound sensitive. But yeah. Um, when I like thought about it, I was like, but you know, one video, there's like 10 comments about it. It's probably something that I can accommodate like pretty easily. And like, I also have like a sound, like I also get really ornery about it. So I'm like, you know, fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Misophonia. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to like keep that balance, but I feel, I feel intimidated by like, I was kind of a golden child growing up. Like definitely my parents, like my brother was ADHD. Um, mm. he went through a lot of meds that were, uh, he was blackout raged for like two years because, Oh. He just didn't do well on um, Ritalin. That's hard. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and then my dad is autistic, but he wasn't diagnosed or anything. Um, and so, like, my mom kind of relied on me of being the one of like, you can take care of yourself. You got this. You're perfect, right? And I got good grades. Yeah. I, like, did well in school. I was on sports teams. Like, <laughs> I just in all ways, I, like, seemed, like, highly, highly functional. Uh, and so right. like, I always get nervous in these like online spheres of like, am I going to fall into like the golden child trap a little bit where like, I'm actually always just trying to perform at my best. And, and when do you get to take a moment off? When do you get to have a day off where you're not perfect? Well, more so I'm, I'm inevitably going to not be perfect. Like I've not been yeah. perfect multiple times and that's like terrifying to me, right? Of being like, oh fuck, mm -hmm. what am I going to do when people find out I'm not perfect? And it's like, they probably already know it's probably all in my head, but yeah, there's definitely that like intimidation for uh, kudos to you. I don't, I don't know if I would do the Chud Logic thing. I don't think I've been around enough to have enough hate mm. to do the Chud Logic, like two hours of hate. I don't, 
I, yeah, I, I don't I, well, think there'd be much. Yeah. He has to be there. Actually, somebody says you should moderate it, which is funny. Like, I think that that's the problem. Well, because you're so much more, you can translate very well. But so can Steven. Steven, I feel like he understands me relatively well. Like he, he said it, we do talk offline. So like he knows me, I think, better. And then, and also like, like it's, it's all going to be how people, look, how you hear someone is dependent on how you want to accept them or how open you are. So, like, if sleep deprivation causes us to see people more ugly and dangerous to us, then you can bet bias blindness is going to cause you to misunderstand people. So it just depends on how they want to operate. How much do they want out of the conversation? Do they really want to understand me? I can help them do that, I think. Or I can try, or Destiny can try. Do they actually just want to hate me? Well, that's easy enough. Just watch a video and make a hate video. Now, I want to say no to one of the comments down there that's saying controversy sells and hate sells. No. I'm actually going to say no. I'm going to say, depending on your goal, you do not need it. I have built a whole career off of communication, love, welcoming. Like Destiny even said, Brittany's audience loves literally every guest she has on because it's an opportunity for them to learn about a new bubble. But my audience hates every girl I bring on to an extent, except Erudite, who's the most professional. And so like, it's one of those things where my audience is not built off of controversy and we are built off of like examining. Sometimes we have our petty moments. We like to be petty here. We like the color of it sometimes. But in general, I think I've built a whole business off of a lack of controversy. Um, my sister always used to tell me, friends used to tell me, you should sell your BDSM stuff more controversial. And I would try, but it always felt really dumb. I had a threesome for the first time. It's like, how can I pretend like my Tuesday nights is something that's crazy when it's just a Tuesday night for me? Right. <laughs> Because it's crazy to other people. That's the thing. Other people, it's crazy. But then I would have to, like, I want people to come into my bubble on my channel and for me to go to theirs when I'm visiting them. But my bubble is not going to shame you for being naked. It's not going to shame you for being fat and naked, skinny and naked, black and naked, white and naked. It's not going to shame you for being queer or gender fluid. It's not going to care if you have a different religion. Like, I like my bubble. It's nice. People are chilling and diverse. Like, everyone out here trying to pretend, like, they like diversity. <clears throat> but in a diverse, like diverse situation, you're going to have to feel uncomfortable a little bit, Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I also know that my bubble is also a particular bubble. Um, like it doesn't have a lot of, a lot of conservatives don't hang out here. A lot of people that leftists would say conservatives are here, but that's not the same thing. I mean, real conservatives, Right. you know, there's not real conservatives here for the most part. Um, I don't even know if there's I a probably think like you're Trump. degenerate a little bit. So that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I don't, you know, not all of them, like, but... I love talking to Lauren Southern, but she was like shook. Everything I said, she was like, <gasps> and I was like, I know. And like, I had a great conversation with her, but like, I'm not going to ask Lauren to come into my bubble. She doesn't even know. She doesn't even, she literally said to me, which is fair. You know what people say this? I hate when they say this. Well, if you met the perfect person, but they hated you being naked, right? It's like, guys, what does perfect person mean to anyone but me? Because that means perfect, meaning there is no but. Right. Right. But then people always say these things. And so I have to go into her bubble at this moment because she's not describing perfect the way I am. So again, we're trying our best here, but I think I think I have built a community off of non-controversial things in that way. I don't want to battle or debate. I know Destiny does that. His platform is on that debate, but I don't need that. And I don't think you need it to be successful. Right. Yeah. I just want to say that for the comments. Yeah. No, that that's fair. That's based. I mean, every because we're women. a different purpose. You know, maybe because like, because we're not doing that now. And I think this is like, when you come on last time, people, I got the most positive response ever. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. People so were nice just, like, them. ranting about you in the Discord, and people were so happy you were here, and they're like, oh, finally. Someone said, like, I'm going to quote it badly, but <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for since the moment he started collabing. It has taken so many shitty conversations, but finally we have what we've been looking for, an erudite. And I was like, I know. <laughs> like somebody who can hear me, understand me, explore ideas, vice versa. We have waited for you, girl. We have well, waited. I, I appreciate that. I don't know if I'm that special, but um maybe 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 the uniqueness of me is just that like i wasn't in internet land before covid and i've really only been streaming for five months so like maybe i'm not like black pilled by by the internet i haven't been backstabbed quite enough yet i'm still naive that's a good point yeah actually that's a great point because you do talk like a normal person yeah like when i like i'm I kind of normie i'm not normie like yeah. in normie land i'm not normie but 
that that's that's what shows me how like like when people are like what is normal and i'm like not you motherfuckers like yeah. i fit into normie land and i'm still like they call me like the quirky weird like zany one you know um yes and i'm yes. like so sedate on the internet land i think people like i should hope like that's the thing is i do um so like uh, i don't know if you know well you wouldn't know this why would you know this in june i'm stopping calls on sundays and mondays monday so i can stream all day until i get tired and on sundays so i can have officially a day off because i have a hard time not working yeah because like i like working so my doctors and my nutritionist said i have to have to have to take a day off so i chose sundays it's gonna be family day or maybe discord day because i like discord a lot but it's like spending time just being here and i love my neighbors i love walking outside and talking to people and saying hi how are you and they don't have any idea or perception of what my job could be no i love that but i also love how just people people are and like they're really not the same as the online communities yeah. like the things we say to each other are things that like you wouldn't really say to a real person because like you would have a, well, a better context of them too you'd be in front of them so you'd be like oh i can feel them they feel fine versus yeah. like other people on the internet you're like i'm getting really bad sus feelings from this person right now i think they might kill me i'd be way afraid to be in a room with Brittany. she might hurt me i'm like <laughs> i guess maybe Maybe I could. I guess if you insult my mama, I might. But, like, in general, it's just kind of funny. I really, I do think people should, um, I'm going to encourage people to go outside and talk to your neighbors, y'all. Yeah. Talk to your yeah. neighbors. When I hear certain people from, like, California, for example, try to explain a conservative to me, I'm just like, you've never talked to a conservative before. I don't think you've ever talked to a conservative before. Um, it's so it's very weird. So I live in small town, rural Alberta, right? Um, mm. And I'm... Um, I've been chatting with my neighbors a fair bit and they like keep trying to ask me what I do for a living um, because my my contract just ended. So at least before I had the fallback of I would just be like, oh, I'm a mental health. Uh, I'm a mental health program director for an online mental health uh, program because that's right. what I was doing. But that contract ended. Um, oh, and no. so now I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to say influencer because then they think that I'm like an Instagram model, right. um, you know, and that's not like, you know. I wish to some extent, but like, I'm so bad at taking photos and stuff. Um, yeah, it's okay, hard to explain what to them. What is your job? Cause like, I always thought you kind of were in the medical field still. No. So it, my contract just ended. It ended May 12th. Um, oh, shoot, shoot. okay. Okay. Yeah. And so my plan was to go back to graduate school in the fall. Um, it looks like basically both of my supervisors want to take a sabbatical. So I'm going to work in another person's mm -hmm. lab this fall. Um, for when they come back from sabbatical, because if I'm supervised by somebody who's not in my specialty, then there's only a couple people who can do forensics and they're both just like, we're going on leave. And I was like, great. <laughs> so I'm going to work in a different lab, uh, in the same university okay. this year. Um, so when it came to work, I don't really want to work for a company ever again. Just it's frustrating. I have my licensed addictions counseling. So like if I need to monetarily, I can go be a psychometrician pretty easily. Um, I have all the qualifications. What does that mean? A psychometrician is somebody, so I would probably look for a jail. Um, we've got a couple of supermaxes, so I would run evaluations like IQ tests mm -hmm. and risk assessments. And then I would send them cool. to psychiatrists and other people to diagnose and properly treat and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so just running psychological cool. tests. Yeah. But do you, do you find yourself like in love with streaming yet or maybe? I do really enjoy it. Um, like not, so I'm actually camera shy. Uh, which is kind of like funny to sh share. Like I, um, I really like the chat. So I really enjoy like seeing people's comments. I think they're yeah. so funny. Like this is why I'm drawn to internet people. It's like when my husband started introducing me to internet land, I was like, these people have my humor. Like the humor that everyone says I'm really weird for, like in normie land. Yes. They get it. Yes. Like they get it when I like make like meme jokes and stuff. Like they like it, right? Um, so I really, I really enjoy the chat. Um, but like taking photos and selfies, like, ugh, <laughs> uh, I, I have, I have pretty bad body dysmorphia. I think that's part of it. I just like uh, really struggle, uh, with the camera yeah. piece. Um, and I'm actually not very, so one thing that's really annoying is almost everyone who's only known me online and then meets me in person will be like, oh, wow, you're significantly more attractive in person. And I'm like, I know, I don't know what it is, but like, you're pretty pretty on pictures though, girl. Like, I, I get that. Than that. I get that. But like, everyone's like, you're significant. But part of this is because I think when I'm on camera, I think I hold my face. Like, I think I have tension in my face because I'm like mm -hmm. uncomfortable the whole time. Like when I do selfies, unironically, it's taken me like four years to not go like this in selfies and like jump my oh, chin yeah, forward because yeah, yeah. I just get like so tense I don't know what it is mm -hmm. but 
Yeah. You know, I actually think I'm only prettier in person because like uh, my features can be very jarring to people apparently from what I've been told my whole life. So I find like when <laughs> what? I'm in person. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, you know, like I'm angular. People say like, oh, she has like a really rough looking face or she'll say, they'll say like, I've been told, that's the thing. Like I, I try not to pay attention to how people tell me they perceive me too much because um, I get a lot of. Um, you're too rough, you're like too edgy, like, oh, you look like a man in your photos. But then in person, they're like, you're so sweet and like, you're so warm. And like, I feel like in action, I'm much prettier because like they can see the whole package mm. versus just like a photo where I am also posing and I'm like, and I'm like, does this look cute? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I but mean, I like it. Yeah. I to like it at least. That's fair. I mean, yeah, I've looked through a bunch of your photos. I mean, girl, you're thick. You got a nice booty. Oh, I'm, thank God I have not worked out in like a month and I was so sad. And my body's definitely like sagged a little bit. It's but, like, deflating. It's one of those things where like I've lost weight, but my butt to my boob has survived the weight loss. <laughs> like, let's go. Let's go. That's like, nice. I appreciate that. Yeah, honestly, I really do like my body. I get it from my mama and she has a great body. And same thing, like our genetics are just like fabulous, girl. Like I, I really love it. Like it's so funny <laughs> though, because like I'll talk to my friends about it and like my friend's a ballet dancer and she like doesn't find, obviously my body is attractive because she likes this the ballet body and then vice versa I'm like oh I like thicker girls and so we'll talk about like the different body types we like and it is so diverse out here but I'm so lucky that I ended up with one I like because like some people don't have that it's like some people no matter how much they work out they're not going to get the body they want right yeah and I feel really blessed honestly thank god because <laughs> like I'm lazy when it comes to working out but my nutritionist she just told me she's like you can't work out for three weeks and I'm like oh no <laughs> oh what a tragedy oh, no. <laughs> she's like well because i'm she told me she'll i'll be back on it though in three weeks i was like that's fine but i'm trying to be better at pole it's really hard girl have you ever tried to do pole i would love to do pole but when i was in the city i was way too broke to afford it and now that i'm out of the city i'm still too broke and it's like an hour drive so it's hard to cut like it i want to do so lessons hard. i want to like learn I, do, I actually yeah. subscribe to a, a dancer that i love because she has her her own course yeah. If I follow her course. It is so hard. These women yeah. have like the most beautiful muscles, the most beautiful bodies, but it is like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And that's why I'm so bad at it. And I'm sorry for everyone who thought I'd be good at it after a year. No, still no. No, no. <laughs> I'm so weak. I'm the weakest person who's ever existed. Like I, lifting your own body weight. I didn't even process and looking pretty at the same time. Yeah. yeah. That's a problem. I might be able to lift my body weight, but like, I know what my face looks like at the gym. Like it's not, I don't make I nice cannot. faces. I can't do it yet. I cannot figure out how to get my face not to look like this. Yeah. Like it looks like I'm constipated because I literally go right <laughs> in the face. I'm putting all, I'm holding my breath. I have yet to perfect that. So yeah. um, note to self. Yeah. I, uh, I, so I have one friend who's really into silks. Um, Ooh, oh, <clears throat> whoa. Yeah. She, she's super cool. It was really helpful. She struggled with like huge anorexia too. So it was like her silk, she was like motivated to eat so that she could put on muscle to be better mm -hmm. at silks. It it's a very like cool journey for her. And then I have another oh. friend who just recently got into pole dancing. She's never been, she's never had an athletic bone in her body. She was very much like kind of like the edgy indie girl who like wore lots of like thigh highs and fishnets and was just like, kawaii and stuff like that yeah. she is so damn good at pole dancing like oh. instantly like cool. she literally she's been doing it i think for oh. like uh, she might be at a year now but like she's like competing now like I, I don't know if there's competitions but she's like at shows i don't know there's show lights awesome. around her and people watching and she's really good and i'm the jealous pole competitions are insane like no that's what i like, I don't, silks too. I have a friend who does silks. And first of all, I'm so afraid for her because, like, you know, she's falling from the sky here. But it is amazing to me the strength it takes to do any of these things, which I think it leads to the frustration people have when, you know, people wear, people go, oh, pole's easier, silks are easier. They, I'm like, I think we're defining easy very differently in the <laughs> world because <laughs> that shit is not easy. And I think that's the problem is that I think everyone thinks everyone has it easier and I think the irony is that everything is a struggle and you're supposed to make it look easy. Mm. When you're really good at your job, it looks easy. And sometimes it feels easier, right? Like there's, you know, yeah. like that's kind of that like Dunning-Kruger of like people who are really, really good at things kind of underestimate how difficult something is because they're just like yeah. so gifted at it. Um, yeah. And then, and and obviously the inverse, um, which I, yeah. I just, I feel like is, is very true. Uh, cause there's certain things that are like really easy for me that feel easy and other people like memorization. I'm oh. just re really, I'm really good at it. My husband sucks. He's terrible at memorization. Um, and so, so yeah. And so it's just, yeah, it's very interesting. 
But damn, I really wish I could pole dance. That would be. Oh, one day, one day. And actually, I have a permanent injury from BDSM that went wrong. Oh. Um, actually, that might be an interesting story for you. Here, I'll tell it to you. Okay. And then um, I'm going to let you know my smoothies are dwindling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I either have to eat a lot more food or just stop streaming in general. I'll make a decision what to do. But okay, let me tell you the story because I thought it was pretty. Okay. So I was with a partner at the time. We had a really good relationship and everything was like established. Safe words, all that stuff had been done. I had this fantasy where I was like, okay, I want you to gag me, blindfold me, and tie my arms behind my back. So I'm like fully just at your mercy. Then I want you to spank me. And I was like, okay, just do that. And then he was like, okay, great. So we negotiated, blah, blah, blah. I get on the bed, I'm over his lap. Everything's where it needs to be. And he hits me the first time, barely, like barely, to warm up. So in BDSM, you don't have to do this, but I highly recommend a warm up, which means to warm up the skin, get the blood flowing, start with small taps, and then really go for it. Don't just like hit someone out of the blue. It's fucking shocking. <laughs> okay. And, may, and worst part is that if it's shocking, it makes somebody want to like fucking turn around and hit you because it's, it's shocking. So I'm on his lap. He hits me softly and automatically before he even saw me moving, I had flipped off the bed, pulled my hands out of the restraints, dislocated my wrist and been like, oh, I got out. And he's like, he was looking at me and I was looking at him and I was like, ow. And he looked at me and was like, what did you do that for? I was like, I don't know. I don't know why I just did that. But my body was like, get out of this as fast as possible. Now, of course, I know why I had been assaulted and pressed down on a bed and I didn't tell him. So he had no why. And I didn't know why in that moment. But I, after reflection, went, oh, my God, is that a trigger from my assault? And I didn't realize, like, it just happened so fast. So now I have this, like, little permanent injury where my wrist just goes boop, boop. So I'm always like shifting it back in and like, you know, popping in a little bit. It's not too bad anymore. I did physical therapy. It was a lot worse before physical therapy. But that's like one of those injuries where I, it makes it harder to do a pull. <laughs> but I wear a brace and mm -hmm. I acknowledge that it is an injury that I'll deal with forever. But it's not a regret that I have because it was something that we did all the cautionary things we prepared. And it was just something I could have predicted and he didn't know how to predict. We didn't know what was going to happen. So I'm not mad at him. He's not mad at me. We're not mad at anybody. It's just like, is what it is. Interesting. You know? and, yeah. and how come it's permanent? Like, is it just like physio just can't like correct? The, yeah, like physical therapy can't correct it. It's more just like the, I don't know how she explained it to me because I'm really bad at like conveying it. But basically I had dislocated it. And even though it goes back in and it's fine, it's always going to be like a sore point as if I bruised it permanently. Okay. So I can hear it sometimes. Like that's why I'm always popping my hand and like live shows. People can probably see me doing that. Like I don't think about it anymore because I do it like reflexively. But I can feel it moving and I'm like, and go back. Like this one doesn't, this one's fine. This, thank God my right hand is fine because that's my punching hand girl. Mm -hmm. That's my everything hand, you know. But my left hand, yeah. So she'll just be permanently sensitive yes that's fair i mean a lot of times like even when you break bones and they set properly that's still like you know you like can feel the cold in them or something like that so yeah no exactly exactly and again it's like i try to take life with this attitude of look it is what it is we did it let's mourn it let's go through our real feelings about it and let's actually get them out of our body so we can move forward because you know we can't change it i can't change what i did to my wrist there's no reason to really dwell on it yeah if that makes sense yeah except um, what you cannot change exactly girl that's what i'm saying all the <laughs> all the wisdom has already been out in the world we just gotta read the books again we gotta re <laughs> review the books again it's all out there we don't i just feel like all the answers to the universe are out there and we just keep going where are they i'm like they're out there we just don't, <laughs> we just don't like them because they're now hallmark cards Except for science. There's lots of things we don't know in science, like how the brain works. Very exciting. That's very exciting. See, that's very exciting. Oh, actually, that's a really good way to, like, differ our brains. The mystery of what science will show us later is not what I mean when I say the answers are out there. Yes. What I mean by the answers is I mean to learn to be content with existence. You mean philosophically and, like, yes, yes in a lived yes, way. Yes, that's, yeah, because that's, I don't know why people keep putting me in a science category. You know what? You guys know I have a high school diploma, right? No. Oh, no, I didn't go to college. I dropped out. Like, I did not finish college. <laughs> what were you taking in college? Child psychology. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's yes. like, I think, uh, yeah, maybe it's the way I talk, but I've also, like, read a lot of books, so maybe that's it. But I feel like I'm really dumb. And, like, I'm smart, but I'm not that educated. <laughs> like, I'm not an academic. 
I think like you're you're one of those people who like probably like kind of created this like idea around you enough. Like you you're in like you kind of are in your own bubble, and so like it's kind of like when you listen to Jordan Peterson. Chaos mm-hmm. means a very specific thing to him that it doesn't really yes. mean to anyone else. Um, yes, but and you have a lot of those words, but I don't think you sometimes maybe you forget that other that it it's an esoteric right. word that it's like a unique meaning word to you. Just like good actually is a very big word for me. Um, but most yeah. people use good in a very, like it's like slightly above neutral, but for me, it's a much like deeper yeah. word than that. But I know that most people don't understand good in the way I understand the word good. Totally. Actually yeah. that, that happened with Papa Gut and I the other day, he was on the stream and he was like, just say like, I, you, it feels like he's like, it feels like you're just trying not to say that. Like, He's a bad person, Mr. Girl. We're talking about Mr. Girl. Yeah. He's like, just say he's a bad person. I was like, ah, bad means something very particular to me. <laughs> like, bad is a very hard word for me to use towards people. I can't hear you. Hello, hello. What the heck? It's not even lighting up on Discord. Like, it doesn't I even say you're connected to audio. Where are you? Beautiful on? though. Thanks. <laughs> um, here, let's try. Oh, oh, oh! Is it better? Can- better there we go yes yes that was super weird yes um but anyways on our stream together i used the word useless two different ways and someone was like see she's lying and i was like no okay guys (laughs) like can we not use words different ways and like the same word and that's what i'm confused about if we know love has a thousand different meanings wouldn't the word useless and bad and good also have a thousand different meanings or am i crazy I no, I mean, th- this is the issue. This is why I hate tautological arguments when people are like, uh, but that's not like what the word means. And I'm like, yeah, but people use words descriptively. They use it denotatively. And then they also use it with connotation. And depending yeah. on which one you're meaning, they're all different and they're all a little bit right. So can we just agree? This is why I hate, I hate these fights. Like if they're like, oh. um, that's not what objective means. I'm like, fine, whatever the fuck you want it to mean. Contrast super chatted $2.15. <laughs> literally, literally. So that's Look, I'm okay with the ever changing, but you're right. Sometimes I totally forget because I'm a person. Take me off that pedestal. I do forget like I'm in a bubble. So I forget. I just see my YouTube's channel as such a little bubble of my own that I don't need people. Like, I wish I could put a disclaimer on all my channel, like my whole channel. Like, if you were here, learn Brittany's dictionary and then make a dictionary of the way I use words. <laughs> Cause that would be pretty funny. But otherwise, what are you gonna do? I think that's why I do accept that people misunderstand me, which is why I don't give myself the anxiety of consistently trying to be understood. Cause like, how would I ever do that? Right. Right? So I live and let live. Um, <laughs> How are you doing? Do you have any other questions, any other topics? Should we talk about anything else? No, I feel like, like you said, you're running low on spoons. I feel like we mm-hmm. covered everything I wanted to chat with you about already, but um, you'd mentioned maybe me, you, and Melina chatting sometime. I think that would be super yes. interesting. Yes, we just have to find a day all three of us are free, which Melina is the most travely of us. So, um, I will message her and tell her the dates I'm normally streaming and then I'll message you or actually, if I have two weeks notice, almost anything can work. Um, but usually two weeks notice is what I need. Yeah. Okay. Then I'll definitely hit her up and say, Hey girl, how's like, you know, some date and then we'll figure it out, but hopefully in June. Okay. That'd be awesome. That'd be nice. Thank you for being here. Thanks for chatting with me again. Of course. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Okay. I don't know why it is so dark now. IRL stream would be fun. All right. How are you guys doing? I feel like there's a couple upsetty spaghetti people in the chat for a little bit. Have we resolved it? Are we all friends again? Um, because I have a dark heart. <laughs> You're just mad because I told you not to not to troll me when I'm in a one-on-one. I don't even mind when you post those like most of the time contrasts. I actually think like, they're kind of funny. Um, sorry, my mic's get all jammed up um it's just in a one-on-one when i'm trying to like focus on somebody's words and then i hear uh what does a rice cooker go a rice cooker sounds like wow 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 in my ear it's extremely distracting and i can't focus that's why i'm saying it but you go buck wild when i'm not one-on-one um yeah i i yeah i'm a fan fa- you're a fan favorite are you going to fresh and fit one of these days? I'm going to have to message them and ask. Um, I took a bunch of photos, so I'm going to post a couple more photos on Instagram. I feel like I need to have a little bit of an Instagram vibe going on, and then I'm going to reach out and be very, very snaky and tactical. It's rude as shit. <laughs> you should turn off the donos during a combo. That is true. Uh, you need to have your rice cooker looked at. True. How are you guys doing? 
uh, Twitch chat, you guys have gotten, you've gone silent. There's some upsetty spaghetti. Somebody asked if we ridiculed somebody who has uh, had a bad experience with smoking. No, we ridiculed somebody who came on and was very mad because somebody had a name on stream called uh, Cigarettes Are Cool or something like that. And they were very upset because they thought that I was promoting smoking. And they were very disgusted by that. And I said, well, it's pretty clearly a meme. Let's relax a little bit. Not all that deep. And they kept on being upset. And I kept hearing them and saying, I hear that, but I don't think it's all that serious. I think you're overreacting. And they said, no, I'm justifiably reacting. And then I said, okay, well, you can justifiably react elsewhere. And then I think I timed them out. Aren't cigarettes cool though? I mean, not really. Like in general, like say cigarettes are like neutral at best. Sounds like me, I smoke. Are you going to have a conversation with Mr. Girl again? Yes. I think if you go into it with the idea that you are using words differently and have equally valid communication styles, it might work. Um, I'm not super interested in like extending an olive branch necessarily. I would just like to understand why he was really, 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 really misrepresenting what our conversation looked like and then basically implied that I am a selfish and bad mental health worker. I think we're potentially going to do it. I need to message them back this week sometime, probably Friday been waiting for a couple people to text me back about some grass touching that I've been trying to plan for a couple weeks now. It might have been a committed troll. That's true. But hey, you can always respect the commitment, right? Sigs are cool. Hi, Pisco. I'm kind of looking for anything right now. So if you have something that you would like to chat about, I guess just let me know. It's the base lawyer that's not a lawyer. Almost. Every mental health worker he talks to seems to be a bad one. I wonder what a good one would be to him. Himself? I don't know. Good question. 20 plus your artistic efforts. None very interesting that I'm aware of, really. Vosh has been a bit of, has been a bit of a bad arc. Yeah, he's been kind of Alex Jonesing it. Hi. What's that for? Aren't we working out in like an hour? That is a lot of food. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Ow. Um, are we working out in an hour?